don't see a gavel, but it's uh, it's 6.30. It's time to call to order the J July 17th, 2023 meeting of the Tarpon Swings Planning and Zoning Board. Uh, will Mr. Vesey lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, invocation? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Just a, a few thoughts as we get together tonight to do the city's work uh, and enter upon a, a hot summer season and perhaps a storm season. May we all make the best decisions to take care of ourselves and our neighbors, and uh, can the board make good decisions to continue to protect the citizens. All right, I'm gonna very quickly run through our purpose and mission. Uh, thanks for attending the City of Tarpon Springs Planning and Zoning Board meeting. The purpose of the Planning Zoning Board is to conduct public hearings on the items that come before us. The Planning and Zoning Board has reviewed the evidence in the agenda packet for each item on the agenda this evening, including the application materials and the staff report. The board will consider that evidence along with any new evidence or testimony provided at the public hearing tonight. The board will consider all the information provided at this hearing in accordance with the quasi quasi-judicial procedures by which it's bound. I'll ask the city attorney to explain these quasi-judicial procedures at the appropriate time. The board uses these procedures to judge whether the application meets the intent of the city's adopted comprehensive plan and future land use map and whether the application conforms to the city's currently adopted land development code and zoning atlas. The board will render a decision on each item in the form of a recommendation to the Board of Commissioners who will take the final action on the item. The general hearing procedure for each item called by the chair is as follows. Staff presentation, applicant presentation, affected party presentation, if there is any uh, public input, staff and applicant rebuttal, and finally, board motion, discussion, and vote. Uh, can we... I, or I do call the meeting to order. Can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Seaman? Here. Mr. Vesey? Here. Ms. Early? Here. Mr. Rockline? Here. Ms. Francis? Here. All right, and item number four, the quasi-judicial announcement. Ms. Kardash, can you uh, read that for us? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certain matters before the City of Tarpon Springs Planning and Zoning Board are quasi-judicial in nature. In a quasi-judicial pr proceeding, the board's function is to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the City of Tarpon Springs Code of Ordinances. This is a legal decision regarding the application before the board. The board may only consider evidence that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues arising from the application and the applicable code sections. If the evidence demonstrates that the application meets the code of ordinances, then the board is required by law to approve the application. However, if the evidence presented does not meet the cr criteria contained in the code of ordinances, then the board is required by, lo by law to find that, to deny the application. Any and all persons providing testimony at this hearing are required to do so under oath. All persons testifying at this hearing must give their name, address, and must indicate whether or not they have been sworn for the record prior to proceeding with their testimony. All testimony and questioning at this hearing must address matters that are relevant and material to the application pending before the Planning and Zoning Board. Any members who have any board members who have any disclosures such as ex parte communications or conflicts of interest, please make your disclosures at the beginning of the hearing. 
Um, the following is the, the established procedure which will be followed at the quasi-judicial hearings. First, the city will present the application and the applicant may ask any questions of the city staff and city, city witnesses. Then the applicant will be given the opportunity to present their testimony and evidence and then um, members of the public opposing and members of the public in favor of the application will be given the opportunity to speak. Then a rebuttal will be offered to the city and to the applicant. The board will close the public hearing and for deliberation to make a decision on this case. At this time, anybody who's going to be speaking, please stand for the oath. That's applicants, witnesses, if you plan to, to make any comment on any matter here tonight. Thank you. Do you swear to tell the truth on all the matters before the City of Tarpon Springs Planning and Zoning Board here this evening? I do. Okay. As a reminder, please state your name, address, and indicate for the record that you've been sworn prior to proceeding with your testimony. All right. That brings us to item number five on our agenda, application 23-60. Resolution 2023-21. This is a quasi-judicial item and it involves site plan approval for property located on the west side of Athens Street, approximately 75 feet south of Dodecanes Boulevard. Uh, can we have the staff presentation? Before you start, Pat, I just wanted to make a disclosure that um, I do have uh, family that owns neighboring property um, on Dota Canese, my father, and two cousins, and then I also live on Athens Street, so. Do you have any financial interest in this application tonight? No. And can you still make a fair and impartial determination based on the facts and evidence that are presented during today's hearing? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Pat McNeese, Principal Planner. Um, this is a request for site plan approval for a basically a food service or restaurant use. This is uh, resolution 2023-21. This is located on about 680 square feet of property in the community redevelopment district of the future land use map. It's in the special area plan sponge docks character district and in the Dodecanese Avenue Main Street transect T5A. The proposal is for a 340 square foot building from which uh, we'll have food service basically and a courtyard style outdoor seating area. Um, food will be served to, uh, through walk up windows on the front and on the seating area side and there will be handicapped access to the service windows in a handicapped accessible restroom uh, accessed from the side of the building from an alley. So this is on the west side of Athens Street, about 75 feet um, south of Dodecanese, and the applicant is Christine Shand, and we have uh, Mercury, Mercury Galarakis and John Halfman as the agents, and they are here this evening. Um, so this is where the site is. It's this little site um, right behind Lori's Soaps and Sponges building, a little bit closer up. So here is the um, commercial building, and this is a paved uh, area with a site wall existing. Um, that's located there. Um, over here is the sponge exchange. Uh, maybe you, you recognize this is where the side Athens Street entrance to the sponge exchange. There's an alley here. It's a 10 foot public alley, but it's a dead end alley. So um, it's paved, uh, but it is, um, it is an alley um, adjacent to the south on his property. So this is just another view, an oblique aerial view of the site and where it is on uh, Athens Street. This is a survey of the site. This area here is the, the uh, site. You can see the site wall that exists on it now. All this green, kind of hard to see on the slide, but this is existing building that is, uh, surrounds the site. 
This is the sidewalk area showing the sidewalk pavement and the utility poles and Athens Street. And then this is the 10 foot alley. And this is the site plan. So what we have is the 340 square foot building. We'll get a look at the floor plan in a minute uh, with a restroom and the food prep area in the building. The courtyard style seating is right here to the north of the building. And um, obviously I'm kind of stuck, uh, placed in this, this little corner bounded by the walls of the existing building here. To the south, you've got the alley and basically the service area and the ramp entering um, entrance to the restroom, which is, uh, will be ADA accessible. So you've got the grease trap here, the um, garbage totes will be here. Um, that'll be in this <coughs> room. And this site wall will remain here. The applicant will be constructing a handicap ramp uh, along the front on this, the sidewalk to access the um, oh, a service window here in the front. This is the floor plan, gives you a little bit better look. Food prep area, service window here, service window over to the north where the seating is, the handicapped accessible restroom here, and then kind of the service area over here on the alley. The site wall will remain. The applicant plans to add a decorative iron, a little iron fence on top of that site wall and to add a planter. So that'll help screen whatever little bits you can see of that um, service area. These are the elevations. The front elevation you can see has the service window and this uh, wall you can see is the adjacent building. So that's kind of what you're looking at from the front. As I mentioned, you've got the site wall that's going to remain, some plantings and the um, decorative uh, fence, you might call it, on top of that site wall. Um, the applicant, of course, can elaborate on the design uh, when we hear from them. From the um, right, which would be the north end, this is what you'd be looking at from the seating area. This is the service window, and of course, um, along Athens Street here. And then from the south, uh, this, this is the site wall with the little fence on top, and um, the entrance to the uh, restroom. And this is the site looking from the south and southwest. Um, these are the existing building walls here. Like I said, the site has a site wall all the way around it right now. Part of that's going to be demolished on, on the front side. Um, and part of this, this part's going to be, be remaining on the alley. These pictures are taken from the alley. Um, and you can kind of see how that relates here. You can kind of see where that is in relation to other stores under Deccanese. And I'm sorry, on Athens Street. And looking at that Athens Street environment, just to get a little more context, um, here you're traveling uphill, um, going south from Dodecanese. Um, there's the Lori <clears throat> Soaps and Sponges. Here's the site, and you're going going up, uh, sorry, Athens Street from Dodecanese um, until it curves around. As you come up that hill, you're going to be, you know, in this area. So this is Athens Street looking north, down the hill toward Dodecanese, and here's the site right here. So you can kind of see what the environment looks like there. Again, here's the entrance to the sponge exchange, the dead end alley, and um, the uh, south side of the applicant's site, just to show you that relationship of how um, that area is going to work. So um, this project uh, we have uh, determined is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. Um, it is an allowable use in the special area plan, and um, it's a use by right. And it does um, fulfill the intent of the Sponge Docks Character District. And that intent is uh, um, 
given in your staff report on page two. Uh, it does meet the SMART code and the land development code. Uh, there are some what are called warrants we'll talk about in a minute uh, that we're uh, recommending. Those are outlined in the staff report. So I'll elaborate on that in the next couple of slides. Um, this is consistent or meets the city's um, concurrency management requirements. Um, it's, it's a pretty low impact project. Um, the uh, traffic does have a, a number associated with it, three, three peak hour trips, but this really is a pedestrian oriented. It's meant for walk up um, customers. So there's obviously no parking. There's no parking required. Um, and really there's no parking around except I guess on Athens Street. But this is to serve pedestrians and, and bicyclists really. Um, so concurrency is good and the project is expected to meet the city's building codes. So the flood elevation required here, um, this is in uh, AE8 uh, and the city requires one foot of freeboard, so it's a nine foot required flood elevation. The applicant has opted to um, dry, flood proof the building instead. That can be, you know, we can elaborate on that if you have questions, but basically um, the idea is uh, that they would use flood barriers and that information is in your packet to prevent flood waters from entering the building. Um, in a building like this, on a site like this, it's, it's practical to do. The building department has looked at this and it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's very doable ahead of, of a storm. So let's talk about the warrants. Um, in your staff report, um, and a little bit more about the design, uh, we've spelled out the intent of the SMART code on pages three um, through, well, mostly pages three and four. And I want to explain what a warrant is. Okay, the, the SMART code, as you all know, you've worked with it some, is really focused on form, uh, more so than use, um, and really tries to um, create or continue a form that's already there and resolve conflicts um, with like a flexible approach. Uh, one of those flexible approaches is warrants. Is warrants. And um, basically warrants are a physical and dimensional or dimensional deviation. So that's what the SMART code says. There's two ways you can deviate a warrant or a variance. And in the SMART code, it can be for things like, um, it can be to grant something where there is no standard, like parking. So parking in an industrial um, transect is done by warrant. It can be used to adjust things a little bit. It can be used to waive things if you need to. It's spelled out throughout this code where you can use warrants. So in this case, we've got um, three items here that we're looking at to use a uh, warrant. The third one, uh, well, we'll talk about in a minute. It's not a strict requirement, so that one's a little different. Uh, the first one is the rear setback. So the front of the building is on Apple <clears throat> Street. So the rear is going to be right up against the existing building. Um, as you're also familiar, smart code usually wants maximum setbacks, right? Zero to whatever for the fronts and the sides. The back setback or rear setback is a minimum of five in this case. And smart code wants a, a minimum a lot of the time for the rear setback because it assumes it's going to be the utilitarian to service area, that sort of thing. That's not what we have here. So your service area is over here on the alley um, and that's where those uses and that handicapped entrance is going to be. 
So um, an adjustment by warrant to zero for that rear setback is appropriate here. It's consistent with the building form that's already in place uh, with buildings being close or connected to each other in this area. The second variance has to do with building frontage. Um, there's something called building front, uh, frontage pulled out in your smart code. This wants 95%, and the reason is because if you look at Athens, you'll see that it wants a, a street wall. Um, page four of your staff report talks about the um, form for the T5 transect, all those T5A, T5B, those are all in the T5 urban center transect. And the words used there, such as a tight network of streets, wide sidewalks, buildings set close to the sidewalks, substantial pedestrian activity, frequent retail frontage, shallow setbacks or none, and buildings oriented to the street, defining a street wall. So that's what this, this section wants. So it wants that 95% frontage. Um, in this case, we feel like the existing, this is only, what did I put, I think 68%. There's already um, gonna be a site wall remaining here, so they're gonna keep that, plus landscape it and put the little fence. Um, there are already walls bordering here, and what you've got here is a little courtyard seating area. So the idea is to attract pedestrians to create um, intimacy or relationship between the pedestrian environment and the use. We feel like this courtyard does that very well. Um, so uh, we're recommending that the build, building frontage um, be allowed to go to 66% is what's proposed. Shop front glazing, that is a requirement. If you have a shop front form of building, which this is, it's got an awning that, that complies with this code. Um, it wants a store window. So that is required or advised in this code. In this case, um, it's obviously not practical to do storefront windows. There's no reason to invite the public into the store with a storefront window because they aren't going in. They're just um, outside using the service window. So we um, recommended that the glazing requirement, in other words, the window, storefront windows be uh, waived. So that was the third one. So staff is recommending approval of this project um, with four conditions, the first one being that um, just to remind the applicant that the, that handicap accessible ramp on the city sidewalk will need to be part of the building permit design and will need a right of way utilization permit. And I should have pointed it out, but just, just as a FYI, you, you are probably familiar with a couple of these ramps on city sidewalks down here. There's one in front of Halas and there's one right here on the side of Lori's soaps and sponges. So it'll be similar to that. And then the other three conditions would be um, just construction plans consistent with the, with the approved site plan, um, developers responsible for meeting the codes, getting other permits that are required, and the site plan has to be filed. Uh, sorry, the building permit has to be filed within one year of site plan approval. Do you have any questions on this? Yes, uh, forgive my ignorance on the warrants, but this it's something we haven't seen a lot of in the past. How are the warrants granted by what procedure and by who? So this was actually something that I had a, a, question, a question on as well, because typically what you see is when there's a variance to the code, you go through the variance procedure of a board of adjustment. Um, but these are specifically identified in the SMART code as areas that grant flexibility to the design. And you actually, as, as the Planning and Zoning Board and, and as the board that first reviews the site plan before it goes to the commissioners, 
have the ability um, to grant that, and then so will the Board of Commissioners gets the final say, just like the rest of the site plan. But what I did ask staff to do is to um, include in the resolution a specific finding that says that you're making the required findings to grant the warrants. And they're not as extensive as they are with like a variance where you have all this lengthy criteria. What you are actually charged with finding is whether or not the warrants meet the intent of the code. So that's what the um, <clears throat> revision to the resolution is going to say. It's going to say that you are finding, if that is what you find, and, and you, re you recommend approval of this, um, that the warrants that have been requested um, do meet the intent and purpose of the code to serve as the regulating plan to implement the, the vision of the special area plan for the sponge docks and community redevelopment area and enable, encourage, and qualify the implementation of the policies set forth in the code. Okay. And uh, one other question. The, the overhangs or the... The, for the service window and so forth actually go off of the property mm -hmm. on on typical projects not in this district we we wouldn't have things actually going off of the property uh, in, the, yeah. in this case I'm not saying that that's a problem I just want to understand what allows it in this case that would not allow it in in other situations uh, the shop front awning frontage type actually requires the awning to be over the sidewalk. Um, it is similar to downtown, a lot of the other parts of the docks. And what, what this, and in, in those two cases, really this, this code form is trying to continue and, and mimic and continue what's down there, but yeah, it's required to be. Um, and I can look it up, there's, I think, th up to three feet over the sidewalk and then there obviously it has to be a certain height, eight feet, I believe, so that people won't hit their head on it. It, it can't go past the curb to the street. So it's a required element. Okay, other questions? Yes, thank you, Chairman. And thanks for the presentation, Pat. My, my only concern with, with what you showed here and, and was included in the, uh, the packet, the sidewalk width since you're going to be adding this ramp area, and you can see it on the uh, the picture of the adjoining property where there are some poles and planters also present on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. how obstructive do you feel that's going to be to pedestrians walking back and forth, which is your primary source of access to this, this project, uh, and desirably so, that they won't have to delve into the road because it's kind of a one mm -hmm. lane each way, sometimes busy, traffic, especially on busy days, uh, yeah. will there be access for pedestrians to avoid the ramp and avoid the street at the same time? Um, the ramp is meant to serve pedestrians and uh, disabled. So um, the, and, and we did, that's why we noted um, down here uh, the, um, the distance. So he's got, um, you know, just about five feet to the nearest utility pole, which is plenty of room for a uh, handicap ramp. And you can, you know, we can make it, the minimum is like 36 right, right. inches. But this one, you know, we'd be looking at 40, 44 um, or more inches to accommodate at least like a wheelchair and a, and a person sure. uh, to pass by. But some of the other ones, maybe you've noted down there, people will use that. That, um, like the one in front of Halas, I know they do use, but but it's it's going to be meant for both. Yeah, that's um, fine. So, thank yeah. you. I think once you started talking in response to his question, I started thinking about it, and I guess to follow up with that, if someone were in a wheelchair, coming up to the to the window to order, mm -hmm. I mean, arguably no one could get past them. I I think that's what the concern was. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, you know, they should, they should be able to, to walk past them with the width that, that we would require. I mean, oh, uh, like I say, um, you know, as far as the, the width <clears throat> of a wheelchair, uh, they should be able to walk around it. Now, will there be people stopping and ordering 
um, you know, and a little bit of congestion. Yeah. Okay. So I guess it's that it'll be consistent with the rest there. of the docks. <laughs> Let me just say that. Well, uh, you know, people waiting for a seat in Hawaii is a good example. Um, and you know, will people be forced out into the street? I mean, some people are going to go out in the street and walk around. Can't get around that. People do it down there. But we feel like um, there's enough room here to accommodate everybody. Um, I'm sure, you know, and maybe the applicant can explain. Once someone orders, it could be they wait around the corner or something like that. Um, they probably wouldn't all be sitting there waiting for their orders. <coughs> Um, so when when they explain the project, they can talk a little bit more about how it operates. Um, I did have a question regarding the exhibits to the resolution. Okay. Um, there was eight pages um, in the backup materials that were provided, um, and some of them have floor plans that differ from uh, this. Particularly, what I'm I'm looking at and kind of um, questioning is the ones that show not only the 16 seats, but that also show um, additional uh, 12 seats that look like they're on the sidewalk. Um, and I don't know if that's from an earlier concept. Feet, I'm sorry, I'm not following and I don't have it. Anymore. Okay, so um, in the backup materials, I'm on page 42. And see how this has the the sixteen seats that have been discussed here, uh, but then down the, here the seats. Yes, um, that um, that was removed from the site plan I put up here. That would be if the applicant wants to do it and can do it a sidewalk cafe. That's not a part of this, so um, they aren't approving a sidewalk cafe. It's not before them, so okay. uh, that's on the city sidewalk. So. I guess I could have had the applicant take that off of there, but um, My they, concern they took it off of the okay. first page, which is the approved uh, site plan. My concern is that with these being attached to the resolution, um, that they will have to be revised to show the removal of those seats so that it's understood that what they're passing is only the 16 seats here and not the sidewalk cafes. I can get that removed prior okay. to BOC if this board is okay with that. So I have some questions, Pat. Um, in regards to that though, I would like to mention that those seats on the city side, are, they're not to scale. I, I know. Way. I'm not <laughs> sure they can do seats out there, especially with no, the ramp. It's a regular sidewalk. Those those are tables that look like they are with no chairs attached to the picture. Yeah. There's no. That's not. It doesn't in any way represent what it, it looks like. <laughs> partly my fault. I asked the applicant to remove, and he did remove from this. But uh, to attach, I attached the full plan. And I forgot to have them remove it from that other plan. And so. I have some questions about the handicap um, accessibility. If you can pull up how far that back that that goes, not the accessibility to the window, but the bathroom. Um, how far up the alley is that supposed to go? Um, and then can you show us that on the actual map? See what the dimension is on that side. So, <laughs> there are some issues with the with the site plan in relation to the actual pictures of the space. Yeah, the width the width on that I know over here it's fourteen and a half feet. Over here it's probably fifteen feet. So we're talking, you know, twelve twelve so feet the, or so from the from the sidewalk part of the alley. Mm-hmm. About all twelve the way, feet. It goes up twelve feet. Okay, can you? put the picture of the alley back because I have some questions about that okay. on the actual like that shows the alley on uh, the real photos um, that one up the this one? so okay. I feel like and it's, it's kind of a question but I also I kind of just want you to confirm it because I know the answer but it's technically I understand the definition of a dead-end alley it does fit that because I think the definition is that only people that can access it something through a key or special access makes it a dead end alley is that correct well it just it's not a through alley so you can't drive but it to is an... used yeah it's right. used and so oh, that sure. is so my concern is well first of all there is access through that's a gate there that can open it opens to the exchange and those fences in the back 
actually include property from the stores in the front mm -hmm. that are allowed to build out five feet from that fence. Okay. I so, guess. and that is all the construction that's done on those properties is done through that alley so that mm -hmm. Dota Canese, that's the front of the, of the other mm -hmm. side, isn't. Yes. So my concern is if the, which I'm sure they're going to use the alley for construction vehicles and whatnot because we're not, we're not gonna wanna block Athens um, which the peak hours for Athens are 12 hour, 24 hours a day, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are no non-peak hours for Athens Street. But my concern is they're going to be using that, understandably, for construction, as the stores in the back do for construction, so as another access, which is, you know, again, that's, I grew up working in that store, yeah, so right. I, that's the only way we access the stores, through the back. Okay. So... If they're going to use it for construction, that's fine. But then once you allow 12 feet through there for the ADA, you will then obstruct those other properties from using that for construction for the same purpose. And then they will have to be, and then my concern also is similar to what happened on backdrafts during you know, COVID is, you know, they tried to take over a whole street and it was actually even mm -hmm. considered that was like an actual hibiscus street, not a dead end alley, mm -hmm. is taking this over. Um, and then by then okay. just taking other people's property right away, because the only way to then build or do any construction on these buildings would mm -hmm. be, have to be from Dota Canese, which would okay. kill the docks. <laughs> okay, so they are constructing a ramp on their property, but they are not altering it, it, the Well, it says in the plan all. through the right of, through the dead alley, or the, the dead end alley. I mean, the access would be through it, but they can't close it. It's a public alley. Right, they can't you, close it off and they can't alter it. But you can't let construction cars go through. They don't own it, but they're going to make it a right of way. So you can't have other cars parked there and then say it's accessible because you right. can't block their accessibility. Right, then, so no one would be able to park there. The, That's the correct. The technical review committee, do they, do they review ADA requirements? Yes. So then that shouldn't be an issue as far as the ADA with the sidewalk that's already done because it's my understanding that they don't do ADA. They just do emergency. The, the, yeah. They don't review ADA requirements. So then, well, so then the ADA access yeah, to the sidewalk so, is so already it'll be on the building permit and our building development department. Right. Um, it's a condition. They'll look at the bathroom and all the access. But it's a condition that it be ADA on, our, on your condition, right? Yeah. So then if it's, but then it, if it was already ADA compliant, it wouldn't have to be conditioned on this. That doesn't... I just put that on there to let the applicant know because it's on city property. Right, but that's The, the that, front that's ramp my, but that they not, will need a right of way utilization permit to build it. But it, if we put a condition that is impossible for them to achieve, then. Yeah, I right mean, now I, I think it's know, possible. It's like, so you don't think it is. I, I know it's not <laughs> for the ramp okay. on the sidewalk. No, and I mean that we'll get okay. to that during the discussion. I mean, I, but I'm just asking other... because it's my understanding that, that the TRC does not do ADA. For the... no, we we do, and but not we've for had the other ramps built on the sidewalk. But that's why my why is any, it on the condition that if it's already so done? Any, for the for the record, make sure you. Know I'm sorry, Renee like. Vincent, Planning and Zoning Director. So when a project's reviewed, so this is a new building, it has to meet. ADA accessibility requirements as part of the construction process. So, you know, the the potential, you know, so they're they're, you know, opting to do the same type of 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 small ramp within the right of way along Athens Street that you see them in a couple other places. You know, they're trying, you know, to the because they don't want to elevate the property, uh, you know, they're they're bringing the flood proofing, so they're kind of meeting the middle there of a little bit of Phil versus, yeah, so, um, but no, we have, so as part of the right-of-way application, I mean, the right-of-way use permit, I mean, they're going to have to be able to maintain, you know, pedestrian accessibility. It's like sidewalk cafe permits. When we allow sidewalk cafes, mm -hmm. you have to maintain accessibility through the, through the right. seating and stuff. And we'll get into the okay. discussion and talk about that, but my concern more so is, the alley? is using the alley for access, but then saying, well, it's, but it's not their property. But you have you if you you're gonna how can you guarantee access? But then tell without with other vehicles parking there. Like you're, if it's if it's public property, it's, it's city so, property. Right? So no, the, the, it's a t it's a platted public alley. Right. So you know operationally nobody should just be parking here. But the, but they're you 
Well, and, so, and again, it, I, I'm not, but it, it's used that way. And, th and if they're going to if, use it that way for construction. For construction purposes, they're going to have to come up with some sort of an operational plan for construction and how they're going to get materials into the site, where their contracts. This is not unusual, especially in these downtown and areas. So oh, the, that's, yeah, how, the, that's the building, how it's done now. Yeah, but. the building department will, will, will work with them at the, when they go through permitting to, you know, to have a, a plan in place for you know, where their contractors are going to park. And, you know, obviously they have to bring materials into the site, but they're not, you know, but they shouldn't be parking there and taking up space 24 seven. But they'll be using the alley for construction and then they'll have to be there. It's have to be, right. they'll have to be there. Right. I mean, I think, but, but then it's because it's the entrance into the, there's, there's three, there's two right. gift shops and a coffee shop right. behind all of that. That is right. That people use to access for their construction purposes. Sure. So, my concern is that handicap, you can't have it sometimes and not other times. So no, what if other construction is done and it blocks off handicap access? I, I, it, well, it, from a, just from a functional standpoint, during construction at any point in time, if this gets blocked off and it's blocking access to somebody else, then somebody just needs to call the police department and they will come and remedy the situation, I mean, functionally. So, but just like, you know, these people have you know, pedestrian access, and maybe they're driving down there and parking behind the building. I have no idea. I don't think they probably are, but you right. know, this 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 development is entitled to access as well. I understand. So, yeah. I, what okay. my concern is, uh, agreed, but yeah. that their access w it should be equal to other access, and that they shouldn't be able to have the access and then block it from. My concern is no, blocking I, it from other that same access to other the alley properties up. because theirs is the first one. It's not right. the last. Right. Understand? One. No. I mean, functionally, no. Nobody should be camping out there. I mean, a temporary drop off for materials as part of a construction process, that's, that's fairly that's normal. My, that, and that's my thing is having an ADA requirement, like it's almost like an easement because you're saying they have to have it, but they're not using it on their property because the only way to get to that bathroom is by outside of the property on the alley. So, so for, and, and, and the applicant may be able to explain some of the, the ADA accessibility issues, you know, a little, but, but functionally they have to be able to provide, um, at, an ADA approved access to the bathroom. Well, uh, and yeah, so yeah. that, yeah, so that, and that, so that is the issue. So in this instance, you know, and we're, we'll look at the condition of the alley as well to make sure that someone functionally can actually, you know, wheel a wheelchair down there and, and go up and use right. it. So, um, so it's not in any, it's, you know, to your point, I think, since it is serving as an ADA access into the building for that probably that rare instance that it, that it occurs, but yes, this needs to be kept open. And that's my thing. Yeah. Accessibility for everybody. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Um, what do I, uh, I had I had a recommended condition of approval. Now I've forgotten. Are, I think. Are they going to be required to pave that alley? For the access for the handicap is, ass? but yes, is it they already would, yeah. paved. Okay. I think it's already paved. Um, oh, okay, I see. Yeah. Um, regarding the yeah, we'll uh, we'll wait till the end. I'll, yeah. It'll come back. Yeah. Okay. Maybe she'll think of it after the applicant. So, are there any more questions for me, for for staff? iPad. <laughs> I can't tell I can't tell what page number it is, but I got a question under review standards comprehensive plan map. Last sentence. Site currently exceeds the impervious ratio ISR of 0.9 currently and will continue as an existing condition that predated both the smart code and the land development code. Mm -hmm. The lot's paved, obviously. Mm -hmm. But two wrongs don't make a right. And I know it's only 0 0.10, which is a small footage. But is that the best decision to allow a pass on the impervious surface ratio? And then therefore, does that mean that every business because virtually everything down there was built prior to the smart code and the LDC. So does that mean that forever that no one has to meet the impervious ratios? 
And I'm going to add just a little bit to that. Mm -hmm. I think we've had recently had a redevelopment application here on Main Street that that was kind of an issue. And we made them work real hard to meet the pervious and pervious ratio. If you could just expand on that. Yeah, so um, that, and I was looking to see if I put the code site. I'm not sure I've gotten it in here, but our stormwater code retrofit section, I think it's 14103, actually gives them that pass. So this is already paved um, completely. Mm -hmm. And if you are not creating impervious surface, then you don't have to come up to code on stormwater I would agree there's a lot of properties down at the docks that that, that would be true of. Um, if you were expanding an existing, you know, uh, use, um, once you get into, you've seen some of them, um, beyond 30%, um, adding floor area to something, um, and therefore new impervious, that's where the, the stormwater code will kick in at a certain threshold. In this case, there's no threshold because it's paved already. You're not adding anything. And it specifically says that you don't have to uh, come up to the current code. So thank you for the clarification. I'm glad to hear that. That being said, since we have a page of warrants that we're allowing some bypasses on some other standards, perhaps it makes sense that something that's in the good, the spirit of stormwater issues downtown that perhaps we say, hey, you get a pass, but it'd be a really good idea if that outside seating was pervious surface so that we didn't continue to add to our obvious storm, you know, since they're going to be building a building that is not going to be elevated. It, it just it seems like a mm -hmm. common sense move on, on my part. Is there a way to implement that? Well, to follow up uh, on what he's saying a little bit, okay, we have this already concrete surface, but they're going to disrupt that anyway to build this building, correct? They're not just building it on top of concrete that wouldn't be to code anyway for a foundation, I assume? Um, we'd have to ask the applicant, but my understanding is they'll, yeah, they'll have to do something structural, but yeah, they're going to build it on top of what's there. But we can ask the applicant. Okay. But to answer the, the question, we can certainly suggest that the applicant do that. This particular one is not a warrant. They actually meet the code. The code gives them the pass already. Um, I don't know if they'd be interested in talking with you about that or not. I guess they'd have to break up or remove concrete. I don't know what's under there <laughs> or how deep it is. I mean, it's an old it's an old area. It's probably been there for many, many years. Um, but you could certainly talk to the applicant about that possibility. Okay. Before, um move to the applicant I did have a question I understand it it's currently you know within the code but you know we met last week about the um, his, you know the Greek town survey that's going out right now so it's you know I know when we have upcoming um, legislation changes or code changes we've kind of factored that into our decisions and I, I don't want to just leave that out that we're currently also sending the city you know the residents about questions about how do we protect Greek town? What architectural thing designs should we should we do? And so we can't. I mean, just because it's not in place yet, it seems like it's being ignored. And we, sh you know, we're putting something like we're pretending that there isn't a plan in place that we're also the city is trying to make to protect the architectural and the historic district of Greek town, mm. and yet we're just kind of like no, but currently it fits everything. <laughs> I think we should. Instead of setting up something that we know isn't um, the the vision, it's just kind of. A, I mean, I think that should at least be noted that 
even though it might currently fit everything, we also have a vision plan that, I mean, we're actively sending out a survey to residents about Greektown and how we can protect it. Mm -hmm. You do have to only apply, though, the code as it's written. Understood, yeah. So that mm -hmm. has to be ultimately what the, the regulations that you take I into. Understand. Okay. Yeah, and this particular was a stormwater um, requirement, which, which would be something to discuss. I will tell you, um, if you haven't kept up with it, we do have a you know, a three-phased major project going on at the docks to deal with stormwater. Um, there have been some um, down this street, our Ferris, and whatever the third street is, maybe Hill Street, I can't remember. Uh, we've already got backflow uh, valves in, so that was the first phase. We're doing uh, the vaulting, we're doing the new uh, expanded stormwater um, uh, receiving on those streets. So um, there is a city project that um, the first phase was done, second phase has been funded, um, and that that should get going as far as design and everything soon. So there is a separate um, kind of issue to deal with the fact that, yeah, it's mostly all paved down there. So that should hopefully help. Any other, any other questions for staff? Seeing none, uh, would the applicant like to make a presentation? Uh, Mercury Galarakis, 402 Pineapple Street, Tarpon Springs. And I'm, I'm John Hoffman at 900 Bayshore Drive in Tarpon Springs. The one thing that was brought up about the parking uh, in the alley, um, none of us had the right to park there and leave our cars there, which they do nowadays. Um, back when it was given to the Pappas family, um, my father, uh, Mrs. Franzi, which is the granddaughter, or the grandmother, I'm sorry, uh, Mrs. Pappas, and now we're talking the older people, of course, and um, my Aunt Duchess, our first, that um, just passed away, um, they did not get the five feet uh, of that alley that is adjacent to... Uh, the Pappas Project, or the, Pat, the Sponge Exchange, and uh, our family that owns it. Um, but we were not, a, it's not a parking lot. Um, we unloaded, and our cars were removed. But if you go down there nowadays, you'll see um, businesses park their cars and leave them there, which uh, we have no intent of doing. Um, if there's any questions for John Hoffman, he's helping me out with the, um, the building aspects. Uh, okay, do uh, board members have questions for the applicant? I, I just kind of have one, and it's just purely out of curiosity. Is, is this related in any way to the old Coney Island that used to be on all 19 when I moved here 22 years ago? Uh, it, it was a great concept. Um, always busy. Um, and it gave you a good product. And that's what we're looking to do, too. Yep. Yeah. And just a clarification, my concern was not parking. I understand that it's not used for parking. Like, my concern is accessibility. So what? Accessibility. Accessibility. I made that very clear. So the, um, one, the one thing that you brought up about the sidewalk, I don't think I explained that to Pat, was the, uh, the window that's on the sidewalk side is basically uh, to view into the, into the kitchen area to see people in there working, but not to serve out of. The, the main service would go into the patio area. If you look between the four tables and the building, that window there is where we're expecting people to queue up for the line. So they should be off off the um, 
off the sidewalk by that point. Where's the trash? It would be in front of the, in front of the four seats. Against or the, the four tables, I'm sorry. Against the, against, it would be against the wall, kind of where the, uh, where the window is, it would be, if you were standing inside, it'd be to Who's the left. The, the screen? It's not indicated on there, but that's where we're planning it's on right having a few cute things like uh, okay. ketchup and napkins and stuff like that out there too for people that need it. Okay. I don't see it. Oh, it's not well, marked on there. So there's, it's not indicated the no. trash are located. But that's kind of important. So, and then you asked about the style of it and the, and the... Isn't that a requirement? Is it on the plan? Is yeah, so they, they're going to have toads. They'll be, they'll be um, you know, uh, putting their trash back here and being able to put it out in the morning from back here. Uh, then that's how where the grease trap is as well. So I imagine they'll have a... I'm sorry, where, where are you going to imagine they'll have a trash can for the public? Oh, it would be in... Near the near the seats, right? And then you would empty it into your tote. Yeah, it's a it's a small one out by the seats, just for the public. But okay, where's the, the interior trash would the, go out through the back? Where's where's the back? Where the, the bathroom well, the back door is? Sir? Yeah, the, through the here. That's right. And how is it taken out? Like, how is the trash taken out? It's it's in uh, the totes, the the green the green garbage cans, the right. waste management um, has. And that would be I on, think it's in the packet. Uh, yeah, okay. the day, let's see, the day I was down there taking pictures, I can show you, the people had, you can see it, the green totes like this out on the curb, and then those get emptied in the morning and then pulled back to whatever business. I'm not sure if those are Lori Soaks totes or whose those are, but somebody yeah, we, we allow across Lori the Soaks street. It's hard to see, is the wall gonna be da gone? Or like I'm it, sorry? is the concrete wall gonna be gone? Not yet. It'll be an opening. It's there. So. About where that first uh, baluster is, that, that steel pipe on the, the left the, that's closest to the to us, that one? This one? No, the other one that you were just, that one there is about where the, the, the ramp starts to go up to the, to the bathroom. The okay. So, but the ramp will be inside that wall? Yes, everything's mm -hmm. on, in, well, on the property Those poles line. will be gone then? Is it the city property, the poles? Only the one, they keep hitting the wall. Is, Renee, are those the cities or the poles? They probably are. So that would be all part of the building permit. There's poles all the way up that alley. Right of way. Yeah, they're going to cut through the wall. So why are they? Are those poles there? I don't know. Probably to keep people What's from that? hitting the wall. Why, why are the poles there? Probably. Right. If you go behind your building, there's poles back there too. Well, I'm just, I'm just asking. Are they the city? Well, because they keep hitting, they keep hitting the wall, and I spend thousands of dollars having to replace the wall. But but the wall's coming down, right? Uh, not no. this part. This part will remain. There'll be a little opening oh, there. That's so. just a basic, I'm just, <coughs> the pole. And we can determine if they're city property. Again, they'll have to have the building. Not city property, doesn't sound like that. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, I'm, I think the wall, if you look at the survey. I don't think that they're city property. I think the wall's <laughs> on the property line, so yeah. they'll have. Hold on, just. <laughs> Let's quit speculating. <laughs> yeah. Look at the survey. Right here. The, it's a very small right piece of city property, the, so the, I really po those need posts, to like see it. Those posts are on city property. They're but probably they? for, now whether or not they ever had a permit, how they got there, I have no idea. But I know. according to the survey, <laughs> they're on city property. So we'll look at that when they come so in for psych they're not in And they go up all the way up. There's no function they can take them out. Pat, the, there's, if you go up all the way the alley, Behind their stores, also there's um, poles on city property, and, and that's not really the concern. We're not just that's not your property. Yet. We're just talking about your site plan. So I'm just asking questions because this it's these are, Good you can't see these things very well mm -hmm. on 640 square feet. The site plan you is can't. a little yeah. bit mm -hmm. misleading yeah. <laughs> as far as scale. Uh, which scale are you talking about? Basic. Uh, you know, just looking at the actual property. Like how many square feet is the handicapped bathroom going to take of the building? That's on here. I, don't, I never, I don't know that I broke that down, but it's... Uh, well, it has to be ADA, so it has to be a specific size. So that's oh, I've, I know the sizes, but I don't know what percentage that is of the overall thing right but off was, the top But what, 350 square feet total or 340? 
340 is 340, what was okay. in the application. So what's a handicap, like ADA, uh, what are the basic requirements for a handicap bathroom? Uh, I'm not sure. It I'd have to look it up. It should be right up there, I can't. And yeah, we, I mean, I understand large. your concerns. We <laughs> don't get build, building level plans at site plan. It is. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> it's a scaled site plan. So. Well, the, the sidewalk with the chairs was not, is the tables is definitely not to scale. There's no way that any tables are on those. On that. That's a regular sidewalk, so. And again, okay. the city. No, no, it's a little wider. Let's look at the site plan. But the, it's also the city <clears throat> sidewalk, right? It is a city sidewalk, but but we're we've we've our intention is to take those off until we go for the but I don't, cafe. I, mean, I don't, Virginia. Can we approve something that's on the the thing with that being on there? <clears throat> um, uh, with what what? You, uh, you can add the condition that they amend the exhibits. Okay. It's just to make sure that it's very clear for what's moving forward. So that would be a fifth condition. Okay. Is to amend the exhibits to make sure that the that's um, gone. Yeah, okay. that those are gone. Okay. We can do that. Okay, any other questions for the applicant? Can I add one thing also? I don't know how many times y'all driven by there, but I'm pretty um, tired of going down there and having garbage just thrown on this piece of property. Um, I'm trying, well, we're trying to make something look nice and continue with something that's just an empty lot that maybe it'll draw people up Athens Street um, we're planning to do something nice and I just don't I mean it's it's a shame that people go by there from the other businesses and throw their boxes there and I have to go empty them or have to pay somebody to go do that um, again we're trying to make something nice for everybody for our visitors that love to come to Tarpon Springs. That's what we're for. Bring as many people to Tarpon Springs and show our time off. I don't know, some people just don't like that, but I've run many festivals down there with the Sponge Merchants Association and we brought a lot of people to Tarpon. Some people don't want people to come to Tarpon Springs, but we surely would like to and enjoy our town. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, we'll come to the public comment section of our meeting. Uh, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak in favor of this application? Seeing none, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak in opposition to this application? You gentlemen can step down if you'd like. Tina Bukavalas, 115 Athens Street, about four blocks away from um, this location, and I, I was sworn in uh, in order to testify. I would also like to add that I serve as the president of the Greek Town um, Preservation and Heritage Association. So first, a little history. In 2014, the National Register of Historic Places listed the Greek Town Historic District. It fulfills all criteria for a regular historic district, but with an extra overlay of significance for its traditional culture based on the Greek community and the sponge industry. Greek Town encompasses residences, working waterfront, and businesses. And as detailed in the National Register nomination, most commercial buildings along Athens Street are one-story frame and masonry vernacular. In Florida, most early 20th century masonry vernacular buildings were brick with some ornamentation, typically brick corbels embellishing a straight parapet. Most had a symmetrical facade, stylized panels or tiles, slender belt courses and storefronts with paneled wooden doors, etc. The Ganatos building, uh, which is on the southeast corner of Athens and Dodecanese, is an example of that kind of building. 
Also, wood frame commercial buildings generally were one or two stories with gable, hip, or flat roofs, often obscured by a parapet. Most had a rectangular plan with a narrow profile facing the street. Wood products served as exterior walls and exterior decoration was minimal and canopies often shaded the storefronts. Um, so there is a particular kind of vernacular architecture in Greek town, uh, which is Florida vernacular, not Greek vernacular, but Florida vernacular. Now tourism is the economic engine of Tarpon Springs and particularly the sponge docks. But what we have is cultural tourism with visitors that are seeking to experience uh, Greek and maritime culture. Indeed, one of the reasons for the very high failure rate among new businesses is that they have not offered what the tourists are seeking. Such was undoubtedly the case with the recent short-lived bright yellow hot dog restaurant that operated for less than a year on Athens Street, almost directly across from this proposed site. Unfortunately, um, the applicant is proposing a building that does not align with district architectural or cultural traditions. The request um, to build a 340 square foot retail food service building with walk-up service windows and limited outdoor seating is kind of like in a mobile food truck. The style of the stucco building is not specified, but the drawings of this box-like structure just do not reflect surrounding vernacular style. If anything, there might be a touch of Mediterranean revival in the shape of the window on the street, but that's about it. But that's not typical of the district. Um, and now, as noted in the staff report, the intent and purpose of the SMART code demands that number D, and you can see this in, your, um, in the materials that were posted, Architecture and landscape design should grow from local climate, topography, history, and building practice. And moreover, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act notes that an adverse effect upon historical resources can include the introduction of incompatible visual elements. And this site is within the historic district as per the National Register. Thus, a variance granted to create a building that does not reflect local norms would have an, ad an adverse effect on the integrity of the district. Now, I'm not arguing against this building. I'm arguing that the style is not consistent with the district. As you heard, the city has begun the Greek Town Historic District Vision Plan Project, which will ultimately include guidelines for development and renovation. The wise course of action is to defer such projects so that they will be in compliance with the guidelines, which we hope might be available by the end of the year. Um, we with the Greek Town Preservation Association welcome more buildings that reflect our vernacular architectural traditions, but the district should be protected from inappropriate and incompatible development. Uh, and we can begin by not granting variances if, if this does not conform to things like the SMART code. And also now, that was about what I had to say, but I do want to point out that I think um, Ms. Francis is correct about what she says about the sidewalk. I have walked, I live on that street. I've walked up and down that street. I can't tell you how many times I used to put on night in the islands. I know that area very, very well. Um, and that, that sidewalk simply will not allow tables and pedestrian flow. So that is something that really has to be reconsidered. Thank you. Do we have any other members of the public in opposition to the proposal? Uh, let's see. the The staff actually gets to okay. respond first if they if they want to, but but then yes. Does the staff have a rebuttal? Um, just I think uh, with the the public, uh, Tina that spoke, um, there are no set architectural guidelines in the SMART code. 
uh, the building and if we want to ask the applicant about that I mean they're they're basically the building behind it is, is kind of a, a stucco finish the sponge exchange next door is my, my understanding is that, that this one will be basically we can't really require a specific architecture as you know we can't we can't hold up the application for um, for a future project this, this application is, is here it needs to be considered um, so if you want to ask the applicant more about the architecture that's up to you um, but yeah we don't have a set standard for the architecture here no. I mean the building the app you know the big thing about this building is it's close to the ground the applicant is investing will be investing a significant amount of money to dry flood proof this. Otherwise it would be, I forget the elevation on site, but five, six feet in the air and somehow, you know what I mean? So, so that is an, an effort to kind of conform to the scale of the area and keep it at the street level. Um, that's probably the biggest expense that the applicant will go to to do that. Has the Historic Preservation Board looked at this? No, this is not in the historic district. <clears throat> that was one of my questions, was whether or not a certificate of approval was required from the Heritage Preservation Board for this property. No, and Greek, the Greektown National District mm -hmm. is a national district. Tarpon Springs has not designated it as a local district or adopted guidelines at this point. Thank you, um, and then Uh, is it a variance or warrants that are being requested for this property? Warrants. And are the warrants that are requested um, within the code itself? Yes, they do meet the intent of the SMART code as required. That's all I had. Thank you. All right. Now, if the applicant would like to make a rebuttal or closing comments, proceed. I just wanted to respond to what Tina had to say. I, I appreciate what, what she said, and I couldn't agree with her more in that, that it's a, the Greek community has special, has special details that are going on there, and, and it's, um, let's see, I, I think that with the history, the history of the Greek community down there, they, a lot of the buildings are not, were started as, as regular, um, Victorian bungalows and Victorian vernacular. So, so that's that's where the the Greek community, the housing comes along. But the commercial the, the commercial part of this, we, we I, I did follow what we, what we did at the Sponge Exchange, which was trying to be sympathetic. We left the bell tower and the and the the entry to the Sponge Exchange back back when we did the Sponge Exchange. So, this building was just to be in, in that same flavor, a simple uh, masonry building with the arched window, but the, but the, uh, the canopy, be, be, and there's two reasons for the masonry. One, one with, is we have to deal with the flood, flood issues, so we had to, it was very difficult to, to flood an, an old board and batten wooden structure. So, the, but the masonry is, totally in keeping with what, what I've seen in the Dodecanese Islands. So to me, it's, it would be, it, it's, it is in keeping. And the, the awnings that, that I'm proposing are really taken from try, uh, t trying to attempt to recreate the awning that is just down the street a little bit on the uh, old coffee shop. There was a coffee shop down there that is kind of on the corner, but it had very long, big overhangs, and that was that was part to me part, biggest part of Athens Street when I was a little kid growing up. So I'm very sensitive to the historic vernacular of the street and the area, and and we've done everything that we can to comply with with those things. So I just wanted to say that you know we're not just putting up a block building because it looks like a 7-Eleven. We we did it to be sympathetic with what. It's going on next door, which is the sponge exchange, and and bring it tying in a little bit of what was on the coffee shop down the street. So, that's that's 
I just wanted to make sure the board understood that it wasn't just a blind building sitting on, sitting on there. It was, with all due respect to the Historic Preservation Board, I would, I would ready, ready to argue with them if, if they were involved that, that this is, is following the Historic Preservation rules. So having said that, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, that brings it back to the board for consideration. Uh, we need to start with a motion and a second, uh, and then we can have board discussion. Um, do, does anybody have any additional questions or want any additional evidence before that? I see a board member. <laughs> I would be looking for a clarification on the presentation of the proposed ordinance. <coughs> specifically in regards to the warrants. So hypothetically, if there was a motion to approve, it would include the preliminary staff recommendations, type one through four, an addition of a fifth for a submittal revision of a site plan we'd like to have removed. And But where do we fit in the warrants since they seem to be a point of Important. The warrants, what it's going to be, in, what I'm asking them to include it in is the findings and the whereas clauses um, so that when you do move approval um, or denial that it'll specifically say if it moves forward that you're finding that the intent of the code is met with the requested warrants. Um, and that's the language that I would be looking to be included in the resolution. And you can even add that as a sixth condition um, so that, again, that's clear. Um, and, and that's what's required by the code is that you have to make a finding, and it's, it's a finding of fact, um, in order to pass the warrants that they meet the intent of the SMART code. And the language is actually specifically, um, uh, Pat put it in there in the staff recommendations. Let me read it one more time. I think it was on page four of the staff report. Yes, and I'd like, um, Mr. Vesey, if you could just double check that your microphone is on. It should be green. Yeah, it's green. Now it is. <laughs> okay, so um, it comes from section 1.3 of the SMART code, um, where it says the intent and purpose of this code is to serve as the regulating plan to implement the vision of the special area plan for the sponge docks and community redevelopment area. Um, and to enable, encourage, and qualify implementations of the policies of the SMART code. And that's on page actually three, not four, three of um, the staff report. <clears throat> so to follow up for continuing for me to understand is that part of the motion mm -hmm. would be the inclusion of staff recommendations type a fifth and then a sixth specifically noting the finding of fact, the intent of the SMART code per se found page three of the included items and then intent and purpose of the code that, Correct. This, that that is the purpose of the warrants and we found the finding of fact that it Correct. meets that code. And yes. that is critical that it is included in our resolution tonight. Yes, because that is essentially um, what is required by your code in order to grant the warrant, is you're supposed to specifically make that finding. Thank you very much. And the amendment of the site, or the, well, not amendment, but the, the change to the site plan to remove the sidewalk cafe, does that need to be just direction that we then take that forward to the board without that? Uh, or does it need to be part of there? Um, I believe that the board had wanted it to be included as a condition of moving forward that the exhibit, and that's the, that's the important part is because they are an exhibit to the resolution, is that the um, exhibits be amended to remove the sidewalk seating. Yeah, I think so. That's That's got to be clear because that that couldn't be a part of it. And therefore, I'd be happy to make a motion, Chair. All right. Are we ready? Yes. I propose that we approve application 2360. I got a lot of paper here. I want to make sure I get it right. Application 2360, resolution 2023-21, with the 
submitted preliminary staff recommendations one through four, adding the strike of the exhibit, noting the sidewalk tables, so exhibit amendments, and then adding number six, specifically a finding of fact in regards to warrants, the intent of meeting the intent of the SMART code using the warrants that are labeled one through three as part of the package. Do we have a second? I'll oh. second. I'll second. Okay. Uh, do we have any board discussion? No, just that I think it's, it's uh, I guess, more applicable that the Board of Commissioners sees the same pack that we saw, and of course that pack would include that page of the sidewalk cafe, and therefore the, the importance of making that a condition to the resolution, because we don't want to shuffle the papers that we had before it gets to them. So this is complete continuance uh, and transparency with this. And I just wanted um, just to make some comments about just basic, you know, compatibility. I understand and full heartedly agree with Mr. Galarakis's, you know, desire to fill that lot. I understand that completely and agree 100%. However, you know, one of the main reasons I joined this board, um, and as it's become more important as we're going through the comp plan, is, is viability and, you know, smart development. Um, you know, and if the, the intent here is from the public comments is we want to bring people down. People are coming. <laughs> and well, we want to bring them for the right reasons. They're going to come and they're going to buy anything you put there. Uh, okay, it's in the sponge docks. Everybody will buy something. But... You know, we have to think, you know, nobody wants tourism to succeed at the sponge docks more than me, okay? <laughs> but long-term, cost-benefit, will this bring more harm with construction, more harm or good? Is there some, should that be filled? Of course, I think it should be. Is it compatible? It is not compatible. There's half of Tarpon Springs is in Greece right now, and I can promise you no one's posted a picture of a hot dog, okay? <laughs> it's not why people come. Will they buy it? Sure. Before Mama's was, all of Mama's, the corner place was called Phil's Yogurt Shop, and that was my second job. My first one was at the Sponge Docks, and I, Phil used to put hot dogs and pizzas there. And sure, kids would come and they'd buy it. The last thing I want is people going down to the Sponge Docks through Athens and buying a hot dog and having a full belly and not eating Greek food. The kid will buy it, but a kid will eat anything you get him. Um, this is, so, it, to me, it's not compatible, which is, you know, something that, you know, is in our code. And I don't think it meets the compatibility, which did not come up in one discussion. The word didn't even come up. And I don't think it's viable. Um, I don't think, regardless of whether they meet ADA requirements, it's, it's a safety issue. We just went through this with the public art sculpture on both sides of Dota Kines. Those sidewalks are huge. And when they are crowded, people come in the streets. And because it happens, and I think the staff said this, like, oh, it happens, people walk in the streets. That's not okay, and it doesn't mean it's okay and that we should encourage it. There are zero protections for pedestrians on Athens Street, and there are very minimal, the, the basic nominal requirements for protection on Dodecanese. There are just white crosswalks. There are no flashing lights that we have downtown. There are no, there's no protection. People speed, there's no enforcement, and there is zero on Athens Street. And I can tell you that because I live there. And it, people speed, people don't stop. It is, in, it is impossible on the weekend to make a left or right from Athens onto Dota Canese. And the last thing we need is people spilling into that and, and decreasing visibility for traffic. Um, and this is, this is why you have to be a resident to be on the board so you can offer this perspective of living in the environment and seeing it and adding this perspective. You know, the more I see these plans, it, it's white space behind there. You know, nobody would know that those, that access and that, that there's property back there that people use, not to park, to access, just the same way they're gonna use this access. Mm -hmm. It's a white space, it means nothing. How many other places do I see where there's just white space and I don't know that there's somebody's, you know, easement being encroached upon. But I know in this sense. Um, and, but beyond, just in, in its entirety, um, I just, it, it won't be viable. And I'm so glad Miss Bukavalis was here to tell us about that other hot dog Stand that I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of. I live on Athens Street and I, did, and I run by it almost every day. I didn't even know a hot dog stand was there. That's how, I guess, little, it, I mean, six months apparently. 
Um, so I agree that I hate seeing vacant land. I have a vacant lot and it's tough to find something when it's especially, you know, nobody, mine is small too, so, but it has to be viable. Um, you know, people are gonna come to it no matter what. Let's make it something that is fitting and compatible with the sponge docks, you know, just because it fits the code now. It's, it's silly to just turn a blind eye to the fact that we are trying to do this vision plan while the city is currently doing that. It's just not realistic. Um, so that's just my reason for my vote, so. But if it goes forward, I just wanna make the conditions that that accessibility is um, going to be somehow secured. And I don't know if Mr. Cuscutis is usually here to do this restrictive covenant things, but I wanna make sure that that alley is going to always remain an alley and never like, this happened in the past where someone tried to take <clears throat> Hibiscus Road over, you know, cause they had seats out there and I wanna make sure that that can never happen. In order for them to do anything with the alley, the city would have to vacate it. So it would take an affirmative action of the city because right now it currently Correct. belongs to the city, um, which is why, you know, it, it really isn't supposed to be used for, for parking or, or um, access only. Right, really. access only, but yeah. there's a ramp um, going in too, which is a little bit. If, if what you're looking for is something with respect to um, being able to utilize that to get to the handicap restroom, I mean, no, the other buildings that use it for this just construction, the same the same way that I promise you they're going to be parking in that alley for construction purposes, not for parking, just right. using construction vehicles. Which when I say parking the cars, I mean for access for construction, for loading or for, for loading, loading unloading. Okay. I'm not talking about what people do with the sponge docks. People do with the sponge docks. Right. <laughs> no one says you can do this or not. They'll just do that. <laughs> uh, no one's saying it's okay. No, <laughs> but I'm talking accessibility. The car has to get there. People have to get through it and back, back and forth. <coughs> um, could we offer that we will require with the building permit a construction management plan? Because we, we will need to do that anyway. Um, but, you know, they may or may not be using the alley for construction. They will be. I mean, we, but they'll I mean, probably, fine. in the morning, they'll probably be using Athens as well. There may be times, for example, when they're building the handicap or whatever, where they need to have people out there to uh, help direct and route the traffic. You know, just like any other construction along the street should, I mean, if the maker of the motion wants to add something, is that something you think would, would no, satisfy some, some this? Kind of uh, so some kind of management written construction if it's necessary, if you're saying With it's the not right necessary, permit, it, then which they'll have to do it anyway. I, well, she was looking for something more in perpetuity because okay. she was looking yeah. for because a restrictive covenant is something with, with which oh. travels with okay. the land. Um, okay. What you could do is include something in the motion that says um, that they <clears throat> uh, cannot use the alley for the exclusive use. That they that they for the, that they do not the, have the exclusive use of the alley okay. um, for for um, the ingress and egress okay. into the restroom. Would the maker of the motion be okay with that? No. Okay. I have a motion. I'd like it voted on. Okay. Thank you. Any other board comments? Seeing none. Uh, We'll uh, end, end discussion on the motion. Can I have a roll call, please? Ms. Early? Yes. Mr. Rockline? Yes. Ms. Francis? No. Mr. Vesey? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. All right, that brings us to item number six on our agenda, application 22141, ordinance 2023-05. It's a future land use map amendment for approximately 6.71 acres at 44098 U.S. Highway 19 North from residential office retail land use category to commercial general and preservation land use categories. Uh, do we have a staff presentation, please? Uh, yes, Ali Keene, Senior Planner at the Planning and Zoning Department. Uh, this is application 22-141 under ordinance uh, number 2023-05.
Uh, it's a future land use map amendment for the property located at 44098 U.S. Highway 19 North. Um, the current land use designation of this property is ROR, which is Residential Office Retail. The applicants are proposing to amend the land use to the CG, Commercial General, and P Preservation categories. The current zoning of the property is HB, Highway Business. Uh, the property is 6.71 acres in size. Uh, 0.2 acres of the property is wetlands, and that's the area that corresponds with the P Preservation Land Use category. Uh, the site itself is currently vacant, um, and it was formerly operated as a commercial golf driving range. Um, the applicants are here seeking the amendment in order to be more consistent with the current HB zoning designation and to remove the requirement to develop the property as mixed use. Um, so this board has, has heard this application on several different occasions. Um, first, it was in February of this year. The board at that time made a vote of three to two to recommend denial of the application uh, to the Board of Commissioners. Uh, the overall concerns were the expanded list of potential permitted uses in comparison to what was currently allowed, as well as the potential impacts to the Bernie Park uh, townhomes to the south. Um, following that meeting, staff did determine that there was an issue in the information that was provided in the staff report. Uh, so in March, uh, the applicant requested the Planning and Zoning Board for a rehearing. Um, and with a vote of three to two, the board voted to rehear that application with the corrected information. Uh, in April of this year, uh, that rehearing came before the board, and with a vote of five to one, the board recommended denial of the application to the Board of Commissioners. At that time, the overall concerns were the potential impacts to the Brittany Park townhomes and the increased uh, floor area ratio or FAR allowance. Uh, the application then moved forward to the Board of Commissioners in June of this year. Um, in between the April hearing and the June uh, Board of Commissioners meeting, the applicants were able to work with the adjacent property owner, uh, the or adjacent property owners of Brittany Park townhomes, and came to an agreement and had a signed agreement that was provided to the Board of Commissioners. However, they felt that the application needed to come back to the Planning and Zoning Board, so you were able to consider the same information. Uh, so that's how we got to where we are today. Uh, being that you have heard this application several times, I'm going to try to go through the presentation briefly, but if there's any additional questions um, or you need more information, I'll be happy to answer those questions at the end. Uh, the, app, or the site is located on the Pasco County line off of U.S. Highway 19 North, um, outlined here in yellow. Um, it's surrounded by Brittany Park townhomes to the south. Uh, there's the northern tool and equipment and caliber collision across US-19, and there's commercial and office uses uh, to the north of the site in Pasco County. Uh, this is a survey of the property. There are a few limiting factors to the development of the site, uh, the primary one being an existing 100-foot wide Duke power line easement highlighted in blue here, um, and that bisects the site from east to west. The green area in the corner here is the area where wetlands are located, and this is um, corresponding to the P preservation designation requested. This is a look at the current future land use map. A uh, majority of the properties north of the Anclote River along US Highway 19 North are within mixed use land use categories, which is the ROR and the ROG um, designations, with the exception of caliber collision, which is um, the industrial general property uh, shown here in gray, and that was uh, amended a few years back in order for that site to be developed. Um, although these properties are all within mixed use land use category designation, uh, over the years they have not developed in that manner and they're primarily singular uses. This is a look at the countywide map. Um, on that map, the site is in the retail and services category, shown in red, as are majority of the properties along US 19 North. Uh, the proposed CG category um, does not require an amendment to this map, so a countywide map amendment is not required. Uh, this table is just showing you the comparison between the current ROR designation and the proposed uh, CG land use designation. I'm just going to point out the main differences. Uh, the first is the overall intent. Again, ROR is a mixed use category, which essentially means that as this property is developed, it's required to have some sort of residential component as a part of the development. The CG category does not have that uh, requirement. The uses that would now be allowed if the amendment is approved are highlighted here in orange, but they're very difficult to see. Um, but that basically allows um, wholesale distribution, storage and warehouse commercial uses, commercial recreation, uh, light manufacturing, and then with an acreage threshold, some residential equivalent and transportation utility. Otherwise, um, the same uses that are allowed now would be allowed in the future. 
Uh, the other primary difference is the floor area ratio. Um, this allows currently a 0.2 FAR for commercial uses and a 0.3 FAR for office uses. The uh, CG category would allow up to a 0.45 FAR. However, the um, highway business zoning designation of the property limits that to 0.4, so that's the maximum it would be able to be developed at. Um, the, this is a look at the zoning map currently for the area. Again, this property is in the highway business zoning district. This is the most intense commercial district in the city. Um, it allows for a range of commercial, office, and light industrial uses. As I mentioned, the current uh, ROR category requires a residential component to the development. The only residential land use allowed in the highway business district is multifamily, and that would require a conditional use approval. So they'd have to come to the board to request that portion of the project. Um, if the amendment is approved, I have listed here um, briefly on this slide the additional potential uses. That's expanded and an entire list of uses was provided as backup with your um, staff report. Um, primarily the main changes would be allowing some commercial recreation uses potentially like a bowling alley, a billiard hall, or arcade, um, and some light industrial uses. And then under the conditional use category, it does open the door for some um, mini warehouse and warehouse use. Uh, in regards to the review criteria, as far as consistency with the Florida statutes, um, this is considered a small-scale development amendment. Um, it does not require any text changes, and it's not located in an area of critical concern. Um, the consistency with the comprehensive plan, uh, staff did do a full analysis of all elements of the comprehensive plan. The applicable policies are listed here on the screen in more detail in your staff report. Um, but after that analysis, staff did determine that the allowable uses, densities, and intensities of the requested CG land use category are consistent with those permitted within the Highway Business Zoning District and are appropriate with the surrounding uses along US 19 corridor. Um, additionally, the proposed CG category does eliminate the requirement to have a residential component as a part of the development, uh, which is more consistent with the uh, historic development pattern of US 19 in this area. Uh, lastly is consistency <coughs> with the countywide plan, and as I mentioned earlier, this application does not require an amendment to that map. Um, so moving on to the additional information. So uh, during the April uh, Planning and Zoning Board meeting when you last heard this application, it was disclosed that there was an agreement that was being worked on between Brittany Park Townhomes and the applicant of this project. Um, but they could not discuss any of the details at that time because they had not reached a final agreement. Um, following the uh, meeting at Planning and Zoning Board and before Board of Commissioners, they did come to an agreement and have a signed contract with them. Um, and that uh, was provided in your staff report and backup for um, reference. Um, just for clarification, the city is not a party to this agreement. It's strictly between the applicant and the Brittany Park um, Homeowners Association. Some of the details, I'm gonna go briefly through these. I'll let the applicant and or any of the members of the public here to speak to go into details if necessary. Um, but it does include installing a combination of an eight foot wall and eight foot fence along the adjoining property line, which is the southern property line. Um, it talks about the maintenance period and uh, who is responsible for maintenance of that wall. Um, it includes screening that would be consistent with the City of Tarpon Springs code to be provided in that location. Um, that is required regardless of the agreement. The City Land Development Code does require buffering and screening. Uh, the next is to limit the height of the building pad that would be immediately adjacent to the uh, Brittany Park townhomes. And I'll show you a conceptual plan here in a moment so you can see which one I'm talking to. Um, but that would limit the height to a single story and 22 feet in height. Uh, the next was to limit the potential uses of that same building pad um, to not include fast food restaurants, adult entertainment, or sales. For clarification on that use, that would not be allowed regardless uh, because of the location requirements in our code. Um, it also restricts uh, car wash facilities, gas and service stations, car dealerships, um, and tire automotive repair stores. Uh, the next, again, for that same building pad adjacent to the uh, Brittany Park, is to limit hours of operation to 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, this is a 25-year agreement, and it binds any subsequent purchaser of the property. This is a conceptual plan that was provided by the applicant. This is for reference only. It cannot be a condition of any sort of approval with a land use amendment. Um, however, as a reminder, any if this moved forward and re received approval, they would have to come back to you for site plan approval. So you would see a full detailed site plan. But this is just for your consideration and what they worked with Brittany Park um, on their agreement with. 
Um, this building here is the one that has uh, majority of the restrictions I read out because this is the one that's adjacent to Brittany Park to the south over here. Uh, the last thing I'll point out too is they do propose potentially a storage use in the back of the corner of the property. And they did provide a rendering of a similar project that they've done in the past just for your reference. Uh, with that, staff does recommend approval of Ordinance 2023-05 uh, to amend the future land use from the ROR, Residential Office Retail category, to the CG Commercial General and P Preservation category. Um, public notice was provided for this hearing and we did not receive any written responses. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back to you with any questions. I have a, a question uh, in general in the process all the way through. Was there ever any consideration to uh, going with a, a lower uh, intensity commercial zoning rather than the highway commercial with a, a general business or a neighborhood business zoning or something like that? Because, I mean, the the one difficulty kind of that that I see that concerns me a bit is is the fact that the floor area ratio is increasing so much. So it allows, allows a greatly more intense uh, development on the property on a, a transportation artery that we all know is, uh, is an F minus kind of rating. And certainly I think they have a right to develop their property. And I think it's a much better piece of property as some sort of commercial property, but I, I have some problems with increasing the intensity of the use over what it is right now. Um, yeah, so when, when we look at future land use map amendments, we do consider all different categories within that range. The CG category is most consistent with what the Highway Business Zoning District allows. And then also if I flip back to the intent, oh, I went the wrong way. If I flip back to the intent of the CG category, it's really intended to be along these major um, commercial corridors. There it is. Um, and I'll just read that for the record. The intent of the CG category is to designate existing commercial areas, which may be either highway or commercial oriented and include uses of varying degree of intensity, of degree of intensity. Um, so uh, after reviewing that with the consistency of the highway business zoning district, as well as the character of um, US 19, we felt that this was an appropriate category. But I do understand your concern. Is it? <laughs> Is it, and I, I think I noted the answer to this, unfortunately, it's not within our purview to, to recommend a, a reduction in the floor area ratio for the purposes of this specific site? That I do not think would be within your purview, no, because you cannot alter the code itself. Mm -hmm. And if the code allows for it, um, you know, what you're doing is rezoning the property. It's not even a conditional use. So I don't think that would be allowable here. Can I get some clarification just so I understand? I understand that this Brittany Park development in the, in the townhomes, that they're uh, some sort of an anomaly. I mean, they're, here's this residential area plopped in the middle of everything else that's commercial, correct? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and am I hearing this correct from you correctly? Because the rest of it's commercial, then we should make this commercial too. Are you saying because the rest of US 19 is commercial? Right. Um, well, so this is more of a considerate. So not every district, land use category, zoning district is singularly used. So there's a range of uses that can be allowed in all different types of categories. So not just saying this has to be commercial, but is the question is, is the commercial general land use category appropriate, which would allow all the uses that are listed here. Um, when staff reviews this application, let me get back to the future land use category. So these are your future land use categories um, that are the currently designated. So I know it's difficult to see a little bit here, but this purple category or areas are those mixed use um, land use categories. This gray is industrial. So this is your future land use map. Now, if I flip to well, one, the countywide plan designates this entire corridor as retail and services. Retail and services, from a countywide standpoint, is a very broad category that covers a wide range, commercial all the way to industrial in some cases. Um, but it shows that whole corridor, including the Brittany Park development, in that designation. 
the last map I'll show is looking at our zoning map. And this, I think, is more clearly kind of depicts how this prop or this area has been developing. So you have highway business, these intense commercial developments in the same immediate area. In addition to this maroon color is a commercial plan development. So yes, this is a residential development, but it has a commercial designation um, component with it. I believe when it developed at the time, it had a small commercial piece, maybe the office used for the development, and that's how it went through the process. Um, so I, I believe that it's consistent with the, the character of the corridor, but that's, that's how we evaluated the application. Oh, I'm not disputing mm -hmm. that it would be consistent with everything else that's mm -hmm. around there. That's not my point. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess my question would be, because, I mean, do we have to make it consistent or do we have options? Do you know what I'm saying? So, and so I think are... our chairman was saying, if I'm understanding him, you know, here we have property that can drain, you know, it's right now it's empty. Mm -hmm. um, and he was asking if there could maybe be a less congested plan for this area. And I, I tend to agree, you know, with his concern, and I still find myself concerned for the residents. I don't know if they know what they're getting into. Um, it's not my business, this agreement. However, um, I just, I have a hard time with just adding more congestion and more traffic problems to that area. I, I know that, uh, to be honest, I looked in Brittany Park um, and I thought, oh my Lord, to get in and out of that subdivision, now, now we're gonna add in that particular area is very dangerous. And now we're gonna add more commercial as well. There's no light there, there's no light. Mm -hmm. So those are my concerns. Yeah, okay, that, thank you. That helped clarify a little bit more. But um, so when you're reviewing these applications for all types of applications, you have a set of review criteria. So this is what you base your decision off of. So staff looked at it, we gave you our recommendation and you do the same as a board member. So in this case for a future land use map amendment, the criteria is consistency with our Florida statutes. Uh, consistency with the city's comprehensive plan, goals, objectives, and policies. And we pulled out um, the goals, objectives, and policies that were applicable to the application for you in the staff report. And then also consistency with the countywide plan. So those are your three criteria to evaluate the application. Um, you take that into consideration and apply all the testimony that you hear at the, at the hearing. Yes. And then also just in regards to the um, kind of the site plan details as far as access in and out of the site, um, and that, that would be looked at during site plan review as well. So that's looked at, you know, is it a right in, right out? I don't think they can cross. Um, but that type of detail is looked at at the site plan level too, which would come back to this board. Okay. Mm -hmm. so Ali, I have a question about um, Commissioner Koulianis, and I think uh, Eisner mentioned it in the last meeting, um, as far as this Moses Tucker, which I believe this might be the fourth time we've addressed this, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I, first, I want to clarify, is this a storage facility? Is this what the secret was? This is... Um, <laughs> is this what we couldn't know forever? They provide it, so Matthew Chandler is here with Moses Tucker Partners. But I'm just asking. But I'm, I'm saying he can talk to you about the detail, but this is the conceptual plan that was provided but, um, but after the board requested. They wanted, is it a storage facility? Is that what they're... They want to do a combination. So part of it is a storage component, but they also have some commercial retail spaces as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so in the last uh, Board of Commissioners meeting, um, I guess at some point there was a, I don't know if an agreement or procedural thing where there was a requirement that if there was, or an agreement, not necessarily a requirement, that if there's additional information that's added between the, the last planning and zoning meeting and then the BOC meeting, that we sh it should go back so that the planning and zoning department gets to review the same material that the Board of Commissioners gets to review. Is that correct? So, so that has been the practice of the Board of Commissioners um, as they've gone into... To working through these applications, and they felt that although the agreement was discussed during April, no, not, because not the, I'm sorry, I, I just want to clarify, not the agreement between them, that any additional facts right, in a that's packet. So that's I mean, what they I'm might trying be able to... to speak to it better because I think that it, it was definitely the reason that they based their decision on. And I just want to clarify that it, is this what kind of what, where so, so the so the to kind of finish Alex's thought so. The agreement was entered into the record, the formal like approved agreement between these parties was right, entered into that. the record after right, your hearing. So the board of commissioners really wanted that full agreement 
to be able to be reviewed by the Planning and Zoning Board. And they also recommended to the applicant that they suggested that if you have a concept plan, which they did, which technically you should not be reviewing a concept plan for a future land use map amendment, which is why it's, you know, why we- I watched yeah. the meeting. My, yeah, so Commissioner Koulianis was specifically speaking about when he was on the Planning and Zoning mm -hmm. Board, there was a discussion about that that was the when new information, I, I, regardless of what that new information is, comes between the planning and zoning meeting. Send it back. And, right. So my question is, it, what you know? There's a, every time I've never seen the staff not approve something, and my concern is that at that point, wouldn't the planning and zoning board at least withhold approval to the B board of commissioners? If the procedure was new information comes, it goes back to the planning and zoning. Yet in that meeting, the recommendation was still approved, even though new information clearly was in the new packet. So, you know, the, are you the asking what, did, still, why, did we not like change our recommendation? Or I know you, you didn't, but I'm saying, it, it isn't is, is that not something that was? How did that practice start? Where it goes back? Was that a planning there, and zoning idea? Was the department a, a, it agree was, to that? It's it's really been. I mean, if I'm trying to, I'm trying to fire about my my memory here, I think it was, you know, concerns that were brought about by planning and zoning board, but also the board of commissioners has you know, has discussed it as well, and. So I don't know that there's been an absolute, there, there was absolute clear policy direction okay. from the board 100%. Because that agreement had at least been discussed by this board, that's why we right. went ahead, even though it wasn't it was solidified. Not, it, well, not, it was not voluntarily. It, you're right. Yes. You're absolutely that right. Needs to be, you know, so we <laughs> went ahead and carried it forward to the board of commissioners with the full acknowledgement that that was new information. <laughs> I fully recognize that they probably would elect to send it back. But so that's how we got here. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I, I just didn't, I wasn't aware of the policy and I was just trying to like, if it was something that, you know, I just, it, to just basically I save everyone's time. If there's new information, and I know sometimes you do tell the applicant and they want to go forward anyways, mm -hmm. but I know on specific things where sometimes you tell us, hey, listen, they, we told them your application, I remember with right. um, Mugros, it's not really ready, but you get your day in court. Like, right. So we can address those things to avoid issues where, in everyone's time. So right. if it has to go back, it should go I mean, back. I think yeah, I think, and this has this been a very unique one because it's this is the third. Mm -hmm. And that policy third rodeo, came, I didn't, so. wasn't aware, or I guess suggested wasn't. I, I didn't know about. So it until that what meeting. I actually was going to ask, based on that comment, um, is is there a written and adopted resolution? No, there, there is not. No, oh, okay. no, it's been like consensus kind of of the Board of okay. Commissioners. Okay. It, it was an issue on some projects that we're all very familiar with <laughs> uh, under, under some previous commissions. Okay. And, and uh, this commission chose in, in the interest of, of keeping things clean and right, and right to, Th unless that to becomes, do yeah. this generally when it makes sense, I think would be the way to describe it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's not a hard fast rule. It's not been voted on. Okay. It's it's just a, a yes. mode of operation kind of that uh, that they feel is is right, at least in in the cases we've seen recently. So, with that in mind, um, staff can't enforce that if it's not written and properly adopted. Okay. And what they can do is disclose it and disclose yes. exactly what information has been added to the applications in between your review and the Board of Commission review. Um, because I will say that um, it's not uncommon to see that happen in, right. in other venues. Um, and how much you want to enforce it will depend on what's actually adopted in writing either for you by the Board of Commissioners um, or if you have some policy that requires them to make a more specific written disclaimer in what they submit to the Board of Commissioners. Okay. So part of our normal practice now when we take something forward to the board is the first thing we is, is we tell them that mm -hmm. there's been new information. And, and, you know, and I've seen it go both ways of you know, in my discussions, frankly, with the city manager about, okay, do we just try to, can we put, let's take this one back, you know, 
ourselves or recommend that they go back. But ultimately, if the applicant says, I'm sorry, I want to go forward, then we just disclose it and we go forward. I mean, I've so. seen Mark get upset when people bring new <laughs> rendering. Like, he's not like that. Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say that, that us not knowing um, the terms of this agreement was not the only issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand what you're saying to, okay, now that agreement came to the commissioners and now to us, but that wasn't the only issue. I'm trying to look back through my notes as we're talking and I wrote things and I'm trying to figure out my own notes. Um, I wrote wetland as a buffer, question mark, exclamation mark. Um, somebody, uh, there was a discussion and forgive me, but I'm trying to remember myself and I'm trying to quickly go through my notes. But I know there were more issues that everyone talked about. I don't know if anyone else remember has a better memory than me. But, yeah, there uh, were there are other um, comments and issues that the board discussed at the various iterations of this process. Um, but it came back to you because this was the new information that was provided. Okay. Um, but some of the other discussion besides concerns with the Brittany Park townhome up to the south was the floor area ratio concerns the expanded. Um, allowable uses with the new um, land use designation category. I think there was some hesitation just not knowing what was potentially on the property or what was proposed. Um, and I believe that there were some discussions about whether or not the um, the mixed use categories are, are you know, it, it's important to keep that in place along that corridor or not. Um, so those are the ones that I can remember off the top of my head um, that I remember. Okay, so right now, we're in a position as the board to only reconsider based on the new information of the agreement. I, I believe in, you can correct me if I, it's the application as a whole. It was re-advertised as a null application. That's why it was presented that way. So it's the entire application. Oh. That includes the, <laughs> the new information. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for staff? Um, the, the one thing that I do want to point out is specifically, and I think most of you know this, is that the city has no role in enforcing the private agreement between the parties. Right. Right. So it's something I want to make sure you all understand. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Uh, seeing no further questions for staff, that brings us to the applicant. Would you like to make a presentation? First of all, I'm Matt Chandler. I'm with Moses Tucker Partners, uh, 7462 Divot Loop in Lakewood Ranch, Florida. A um, Couple of things, I had a whole presentation, but I know you guys have a, uh, a workshop after this, so I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can be. Um, couple of the concerns, the two major concerns um, were the floor area ratio and the and the um, the neighbors? We only thing we're trying to do is to to get a CG um, zoning so we can do a storage facility. Now, why didn't we just come out and say we wanted to do a storage facility? Well, we were not allowed to put, uh, give a site plan um, on a on a land uh, on a map amendment. We tried to do site plan all of this at one time. And that's not the way y'all's process works. So we could not um, give you a site plan, um, but they, you know, giving the situation here, they said, the city said, hey, you probably just need to add that. So that's what we did. Conceptually, this is what we're trying to do. It is when we, if hopefully we are able to come back to you for site plan, this is um, pretty much what we're, what we're trying to do. Let me point out a couple of things. Mm -hmm. The development itself. You, um, one of the commissioners said, you know, we're adding traffic. Yes, we are adding traffic. Any development on that side is going to add traffic. And, and it doesn't matter if it's ROR, if it's CG, or if it's industrial, it's going to add traffic. One of the things we've been very sensitive to, and I think Renee and Allie and Pat would um, agree with this on the, agree with me on this, is when we first sat down with them, one of the first things they said is, this city is, is, is very big on the traffic generator. Very big on the traffic generator. So we, we, we have done a lot of QSR, uh, quick, quick service restaurant, fast food development all over the place. And we were like, okay, well, we'll just do that there. Well, no, 
you guys are not going to want that much traffic there. And so what can we develop? What uses can we use to, to um, lessen the traffic? And storage does that. Storage does a, it's a, a, doesn't even compare genera a ta a traffic generation-wise a lot uh, to, to a lot of different uses. I know I'm kind of scattered here, but I'm trying to answer y'all's questions. Um, as far as the issues with the neighbors, and the neighbors are here tonight, um, we, did not, the, we did not realize we had an issue with the neighbors. When we uh, met with the city, they understood what we were trying to do, and they were supportive of what we were trying to do. We went to two TRC meetings. They were, they were uh, regular comments, no really negative comments. And so when we came before y'all, we did not know we had a, a neighbor issue. The first thing we did as soon as that meeting was over, we walked outside and said, hey, guys, let's sit down. And it took us until June to get that agreement. So when we came back before y'all, we did not have an agreement in place and could not present something. We didn't know if we were going to get an agreement in place. But when we sat down with them and said, hey, guys, you know, right now we can put a... a uh, uh, Firestone or a good deer sitting right there. That's one of the uses they didn't want us to, uh, to do, and so we pulled it out. We gave them almost every concession they wanted us to make. So as far as, and that's, and why it took us so long to get to it is because it's a homeowner's association. It's not just one property owner. It's, it's the association, me being president of my homeowner's association, it, it, it takes time. You have to, uh, you have to get everybody together. You have to, uh, uh, you know, post the meetings and all of those things. And so it just takes time. So we're very sensitive to what you guys are sensitive of. And, and that is the traffic generation. Now, I'll deal with floor area ratio. Yes, it does double, right? But if you'll think about it in the terms of what we're really doubling, this is the biggest area that we're going to produce right here to construct. It is one building, um, and that is the least, one of the least amount of traffic generating um, uses that we could put there. Now, yes, we're going to have a couple of out parcels here. Uh, this could be a little strip, this could be a little strip center, you know, three to bay five, three to five bay strip center, or something like that, and we have no idea what we're going to do up here, but obviously it would be within the uses and come back to you guys for site plan. Let me point out one, a couple of other things. The wall that they want, it goes from here to right here, and then the fence goes the rest of the way. Um, uh, another one of those uh, issues that came up the first time was the easement. A lot of people didn't believe that that easement is uh, va uh, valid. That easement is very much real, and it is 640 by 100. It's almost an acre and a half. If you notice... If you would think from a developer standpoint, we'd say, okay, well, we're going to run that uh, interior road right down the middle of that development, right? Because that's where the easement is. That makes sense. It's just, it's a power line easement, and that's it. Duke says, no, you can't touch our easement. Can't touch our easement. You can cross, and that's the only way we'll give you access. And oh, by the way, your storm, your uh, retention pond, it cannot touch. And so if, if we were, if this was different, if they would have allowed us to do that, we would have changed how we set this up. Mm. So the only thing that they said is that they possibly would give us a look, some parking in their easement, but it depends on where it was. Um, so that, that easement is real. It is a problem. Um, and if I had to pick this property to develop, I wouldn't pick it, but... Uh, our president's owner, our president uncle in front of Tampa owns this property. So um, <laughs> it just is what it is. I'll answer any questions. I know I kind of ran over there, and, but hopefully that answers your questions and gets you a little more comfortable with what we're really trying to do and why we're trying to do it. And, and, and I know that the, the uh, neighbors are here, and if they want to speak positively for it, I think that they, they indicated they would speak positively for it. I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm glad that you came tonight. I was kind of looking forward to speaking with the attorney again, but it's, well, it's important some, that you take the staff's well, advice on who should present <laughs> applications <laughs> um, from the beginning. I think it probably would have avoided a lot of the issues that we had. Probably. Yeah. Um, I just a little confusion. From the beginning, I think you said 
the staff told you you were not allowed I don't know to submit a site plan maybe allowed not well we tried <laughs> to I'll let her address that but we tried to do site plan review at the same time they actually wanted to run dual applications okay. I cannot do that mm -hmm. but but as a matter of of practice when you're doing a land use map amendment you're really supposed to look at it on the balance of n not unless you've got a development agreement in tow, then you can bring a concept plan or something into play. So that's why we did not encourage, you know, putting an exhibit in because it's, it's not, one, it's not enforceable. Now, obviously a plan, if they get approved, is gonna come back through you and you're gonna look at it and say, huh, this may or may not look like the concept plan that we saw. But so, I, um, you know, as a matter of practice, we generally do not have a site plan or a concept plan attached to a land use map amendment. Um, when I got to the Board of Commissioners, they were like, well, it would probably be helpful. I'm like, okay, I will include it in the backup when it comes back to you, so. So we were just really doing what we were. that with the, your, your subsequent proposals with the neighbors, because I'm just, did, so you just didn't, know what you were gonna build and that's why you didn't get a site plan or you, you cause I'm just trying to make sure that those are consistent, that mm -hmm. you didn't know what you were gonna build and that's why you didn't have a site plan or cause you told that you, you shouldn't have one and then later you decided what you were gonna build? No, I mean, candidly, you know, we've seen the site plan, we saw the concept plan. We, you know, I did not think it was proper to include it with a land use map amendment. So I think they've been fairly consistent with what they've intended to do all along. But, so well, I don't think that's yeah. been clear to us at all. I'm sorry, yeah. I no, mean, it, it, yeah. I, well, I know it hasn't been. We okay. have been up here saying, why are we changing things and we don't know what you're going to build. Yeah, and, and apparently and it's been, no, that has been the problem all along. So and, and I, this is a real double- Unless I'm alone here, please. <laughs> I totally understand what uh, you're saying. Actually, I think you're alone. I completely understood the process. Um, I mean, it's a double-edged sword for us. You knew what they were going to build? No, I understood why it wasn't being presented and why certain things okay, weren't well, presented at that time. Good for you. Good for you. But I, I, I just remember again, those I wasn't meetings. asking you specifically, but I, that was my concern, and I'm allowed to address my own concerns. Oh, you're right. Actually, forgive me. You said out loud, maybe I'm alone and not understanding, and I wanted to confirm, at least for me, I you're alone it. and not understanding. And I'm just saying, I didn't, I did not know, and I'm addressing inconsistencies with the comments okay so I'm just I want to be clear because the issue with this has been that we feel like we've kind of been it's hasn't been honest and you just said we we weren't allowed to which that's not true there is no I'm, I'm gonna I'm sorry no, no, I'm my gonna, issue but yeah. my issue has been that yeah. there's been some kind it's you know and then the agreement that came up was it was not voluntarily given to us no it was not and that was misrepresented to the Board of Commissioners <laughs> by not only well, the, was it Ms. the the attorney that represented the that represents the applicant came up here. She's an attorney under oath. Said that she didn't really want the motion to be reheard. Oh, she well, said yeah, that. And I, and I, yeah, <laughs> well, I, I don't remember. And that's entirely said, inaccurate because I have a letter saying I would like my motion to be reheard. Right. Mr. And then she said, "Well, we didn't really want to go back, but that's your procedure." And then we—that's not true. We, we we didn't have a procedure. We specifically asked the attorney. Well, you don't have one, but this well, is the, what the Board of Commissioners does. So we followed procedure, gave the extra motion on her request, okay? And so, and, but this was not relayed properly at the, no, let me finish, Okay, please. all right, all right. I'm talking, so this was not relayed at the meeting at all, and not by you or the applicant, which the attorney representing. So now that we have somebody else here, all I'm asking for is full disclosure. And while Mr. Vesey might be a little bit more knowledgeable about this stuff, I'm not, and I'm trying to learn, but please be upfront is I, all I'm asking. And I'm glad to know, I had no idea what was coming. And it, I don't think, just because Mr. Vesey knew, I still don't think I'm the only one. And even if I am the only one, I have a right to know that's why I'm here. And, and I would just say again, at the re <coughs> recommendation, I think she said at the recommendation of the city staff. Now we're developers coming in trying to to, to, to do a development. And when city staff says that really doesn't go in the land use amendment uh, uh, meeting, we said, okay. And so that's why it was not there. No, I mean, I mean, I get the picture now. I mean, I, I do, I not happy with it, but I understand it. Yeah. I mean, we're again, I'm not, we're I'm not, not necessarily with you. I, yeah. I get it. Yeah. We're, we, we were doing what we were advised to do and that's not throwing them under the bus. That's just the truth. I understand. 
And if I can have one minute. So how we've gotten to this point is we literally changed the land development code from on a procedural basis of how applications are heard specifically to stop site plans and land use rezonings traveling together as a package. A land use map amendment is really a standalone, in this instance, is a standalone. I mean, I mean, that piece of paper is not worth anything in, other than maybe it might give you some peace of mind, but it is absolutely not a condition of approval in any way enforceable. Now, as a matter of practicality, they come back through and they see something different, and you may have issues with that, but you still have, at that point, you still have to look at the land development code and the zoning and everything and say, is because it's quasi judicial at that point. So, you know, we've had very clear direction that we want a land use map amendment to stand on its own merit. It's either a good amendment, it comports with the vision, however, you know, the comp plan and whatever, or it doesn't. But how and do you so, know? How do you know? <laughs> and, and I, go ahead. Well, here's what I was going to say, and, and I, I know you don't do a lot of development agreements, but a lot of times when you are, the, the correct mechanism to do them in tandem, particularly the way that your code is written, is to do it through a development agreement. Right. That is what guarantees that the land use amendment is going is going to be based on the site plan that you're passing and it's done through that process, which is a much different process than what you all are going through now. Um, and so that's why, um, you know, it's more important for you to realize when you do change that land use, you are changing that category and that list of available uses and not whatever specific concept plan they're putting forward. But here's my confusion. Okay, if we change the land <coughs> use designation, we say, oh, okay, even though we have no idea what it's going to be used for specifically. We, we this is on the board. We have no idea. So, so if they say, you know what, let's just trash this development. You know, let's, nah, let's, let, nah, you know. And so then it's been changed based on what? Based on, you know, you were asking about the compatibility and you asked about the comp compatibility in relation to the uses around it. That's really sort of the point of your future land use maps. Um, it's supposed to be based on a progressive compatibility of what you're putting next to each other, densities and intensities of uses um, that can go together and why you don't want something necessarily like industrial right next to residential. But right? somebody could want to develop more townhomes. But you, but but see, there there therein lies the one of the issues. ROR makes us put some sort of residential component in there. Well, the the city and the county have said that's really not compatible. City really, the city staff really doesn't want to see that there. Duke Energy does not want to see it there. And and I would just add, we not only have to get your approval, we also have to get Duke Energy's appro approval on our entire site. Mm -hmm. And why? because they're giving us access across their easement. So they control it as well. Now, we, we are huge multifamily developers. We could put, you know, all kinds of units on there if we didn't have that easement. The easement is a huge deal. And, and it's not a, again, I'm, it, we have not tried to be secretive. One of, the, one of the parts about the agreement, we didn't have the agreement worked out. We didn't have it. We that didn't know clear. we were going to get it. That was clear. Yes. That was clear. That we, was okay. we did not know. We, we didn't know if we were going to get it. So us disclosing that we had an agreement would have been disingenuous on our part. Yeah, I don't think the issue, at least for me, yeah. wasn't the agreement. I, it, it gave me some pause. Sure. But it wasn't, that wasn't the main issue for me. It's, it's, my confusion comes, like I said, it's, so we changed the designation, but then everybody said, yeah, but it's consistent with everything else. That doesn't mean... You know, you throw bad after bad. Sure, but if you look at if you looked at your zoning and Ali, correct me if correct me if I'm wrong. All our all the west side of 19 is basically ROR, that has been changed to be some sort of conditional use, i.e., the multifamily or the uh, condos next to us. And so, do do we want to see more condos? I don't I don't think they want to see more condos backing up. I was against, just using yeah, that as an example. Right. Well, 
But so, so you're right. You don't always know what we're going to do, but we are, <laughs> you know, it would, it would be really hard for me to stand up here and tell you what we're really trying to do and then come back for site plan review and say, and you, me, you look at me and go, you lied to me. Yeah. And, and, and that's just not who we are. We've done, I mean, we're developers first, we're brokers second, we're property managers third. I mean, no, no, I understand, and yeah. I'm kind of, you know, I don't, I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm no, not no. saying you. Sure, <laughs> I'm sure. Just saying, sure. It, the process is is beginning. It's really starting to confuse me why we can't know. Yeah. What it's going to be used for when we change the designation, and then I'm told <clears throat> that well, it's consistent. Right. So, then why was it something else? It, I just, mm -hmm. I'm. This is my issue. And I'm trying to understand, you know, I, I want to make a decision personally based on as much information as I can get. Well, so, our site plan, the truth, mm -hmm. we can't do a whole lot of things here because of that easement. We're, so storage is, true. if you look from a compatibility and you look from a traffic generation, Storage is one of the best things we can do here. Now, I don't, I'll, I'll sit right here and tell you, these, these two lots, I don't know what they're going to be yet because we don't know what we can do. I mean, it could be, for, for instance, a, a non-emergency urgent care. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not a huge traffic generator. It's going to, more than likely, one of these lots is going to be a single tenant, and possibly one, this lot may be a three- to five-bay little uh, strip center. Has anybody done a floor area ratio calculation? I know it doesn't mean anything at this point, but just out of curiosity as, as, as far as how this would calculate out for both the floor area ratio, I guess, and in, in impervious. Well, if you, if you the, this lot's, um, you see this road right here really kind of restricts what we can do on the lot uh, to the north. So that lot's more than likely going to be me, um, uh, smaller. What I don't want you guys to do is hold me that road's going to stay right there. Could it come here? Maybe, but the problem is, is then we get into the, depend, uh, the retention pond, mm -hmm. right? And so I don't think we can fit that road there. Now, if the engineers come back and say we can, then, then it may get shifted depending on what uses, but that back there more than likely is going to be a storage facility. How big is it going to be? Can't answer that. And the reason I can't answer, I think that's where you were going with your question. I doubt it's going to be more, it's all going to be uh, climate controlled. It's not going to be um, climate controlled and non-climate controlled. Once you start going over three stories, and I don't think we can go over three stories, Renee, because of the height level. So I think we would be restricted to three. You start getting into the soil, what's beneath you, what kind of foundation you have to put. Then you start getting into uh, construction numbers. And so... I, I, I would be disingenuous if I said exactly what that's going to be how, or how big that's going to be. Yeah. I was just going to look at some of our notes when we came and had a discussion item with the technical review committee. I know that we talked about floor area ratio. I don't know. I'm going to double check and see if we did any sort of calculation. Um, but I do not want it to be said that this is hard and fast what it is. But that way I give you an idea. Yeah. Um, just so just give me a moment. I'll try and pull ballpark it Ballpark to see what appears to be reasonable. I'm glad you're here this evening. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes we do a disservice to ourselves. When you come into a, uh, you know, you hire attorneys, you hire civils, you hire planners, and you tell them to go do their job. And sometimes you just need to hear from us and, and put a face uh, with a name. Um, and I regret that I didn't get up, um, but, uh, you know, I'm here now, and I'm trying to make this right, um, you know. You. I'm trying to make it right, and I'm trying to be honest. I mean, I'm, I, I, everything I'm saying is... Factual that I know it. Questions. No, I appreciate it as well. I, I wanted to make that clear. I just know that when I had the discussion with Pat and Renee, it was recommended, <laughs> I think, earlier on in the process. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you guys for hearing it another time. I know that, you know, we, we didn't want to go to them and come back, but that's what we had to do. All right, that brings us to public comments. Do we have members of the public here wishing to speak in favor of the application? State your name and address, please. Vince Manna, 
925 Ozzy Court, Tarpon Springs, Florida. I'm the president of Brittany Park Townhomes Association. And what we're also forgetting, you straight down the center, Duke, that easement, they're there now. They're breaking ground. Mm -hmm. They're going right into the woods and going all the way to Dixie Highway. And they aren't, they're not moving like we had, he had stated a long time ago. They won't flex. They're going right through it. And for us, what's going straight down the center, because I got the person in charge of the project, medium height, high powered lines. And the reason why he can't build residential up against us, you have to be 280 feet away from the power lines. So what they're doing is from the back of our building, they're going up. Mm -hmm these poles and they're they're legal as far as our agreement I mean our agreement is basically what she said the wall the single story height our board voted on it the residents are satisfied with it and the, our concern for it was our safety of our property line with the wall and what we worked out our property is secure prior to this I've had the call to have homeless people moved at pitch tents Motorcycles running around, all sort of vandalism on that property spilling over into ours because the line wasn't secure. But we're, we're in agreement. And yeah, we would love residential up against us, but you can't. However, it was formed years ago, and I'm sure Duke had the right of way because they're going right through the preserve that's there. So they got all the power. So when he says, when, they, when I first heard it two times ago about, well, can you move it? Mm -hmm. They're not moving. They're not flexible. They're just. That's know. a 1943, 1946 mm -hmm. Eastman? Yes. Or 1940? It's, 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 it's all right. Yeah. I mean, if you have any questions, I'll answer it. But that's basically it in a nutshell. We've been, we've discussed it before. We, it was time working out the agreement because as far as myself and the board members for the community, our Careful. concern is, <laughs> our concern is, our residents and the security of our property, and we, we're, we're satisfied with it, you know, on our side. For where the other side is, I mean, it's further enough away from us, and with the wall and the eight-foot fence, our property is secured when and if it happens. But to us, it's a win. You know, they get what they need to do because the pro property is a fluke. Well, ours is secured, which we want, and talk to them with some more extra tax money. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other members of the public wishing to speak in favor? Any members of the public wishing to speak against? Seeing none, uh, that brings it back, or we close public comment. Uh, does the staff desire to make any rebuttal or closing comments? Um, I do not. I'm still trying to find the report, but I'm having uh, computer issues. If I find it, bef I will let you know. I'm assuming the applicant doesn't want to rebut or make closing comments. Uh, unless you don't have a question, I'm, I'm good. All right. That brings it back to the board for consideration. As usual, I need a motion and a second, and then, then we can discuss. I would make that motion, Mr. Chairman, to approve application uh, 2022-141 and adopt ordinance 2023-05. Uh, I understand that the, uh, the agreement between the parties does not enter into our decision or enforcement, and uh, I'll let it stand alone as is with the staff recommendations in pride. I'll second the motion. All right. Uh, do we have board discussion? comments um you know i think it's interesting how sometimes the more controversy an issue gets i guess the less the issues that started off being an issue and something just disappear and it happens in the news all the time now we're all it's all about the agreement and you know my colleague made a very good point that really that wasn't the issue from day one it was you know why are we changing the code it was like that for a reason and that hasn't even come up tonight at all. Um, and I've still have never gotten an answer as to how this, this discrepancy happened. And since we've been working the new comprehensive code, it's very important. I can see now how important it is when things don't match. 
and then how there's no explanation, and now I can see how there's no explanation. You can just have a workshop, and then people just say, oh, that sounds good, and I guess because at the time, that's what whoever wanted it to be is like that, and now it doesn't match, so this person wants something, and they found this discrepancy, and you gotta give it to them, and don't worry, they can go and get the conditional use later, um, and they need that, so this is inconsequential. So we're advisory, so you know, you always have the, you know, we don't actually don't need our approval, although I respect that you came in instead of the attorney. Um, but I will say that um, as an attorney, I'm in front of judges sometimes, and I never understood why when two parties agree, the judge will sometimes still deny <laughs> your agreed order. But I see it today because, you know, Unfortunately, I, you know, I look, I look out for the residents, but future residents and people beyond this generation and the next generation. So seeing that the other side is now completely supportive of the other side, <coughs> it doesn't sit well with me. But again, I'm, we're advisory, so that's just my, those are my comments. I don't think that we've really addressed the main issues tonight. Um, and I just think the way that this all came about, there's a reason that it just doesn't sit well with me to, to approve it. But. And I, I would share too that I, I'm, I, I still have some real concerns related to the floor area ratio and the density of a development, not necessarily that this depicts, but that, that could still, everything could change once we approve this and could still go on that property. Uh, and, and I don't know how to fix the problem, honestly, because it's, it's partly the way things work. And I'm not entirely sure how I feel about that yet. But anyways, any other comments? I'm, I'm feeling the way you're feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, based on, on the, the history that, that I've encountered from this issue. And I, I, that is my problem with it. I feel better this evening having heard from you um, I do feel better, but I still have concerns as well. And, and what I would say definitely, if, if this uh, passes, I, I think, and I shouldn't speak for everybody, but I know for, for me, I'm going to be looking very critically at the final site plan and what the floor area ratios really are and, uh, you know, how, how everything really works out because uh, I, I think it's a real problem to increase the density of development on US-19 in today's world. And Chairman, I, I would just comment, I concur with, with those observations and, and the others brought up uh, here in the comment portion. Uh, it is an arduous process. First of all, I commend both sides for kind of building a bridge uh, in this matter and at least getting to the bottom of what may or what may not. Uh, like I said, we have no say in the enforcement of that agreement. We'll leave that up to your attorney and uh, whoever's gonna represent the developer. But that's almost an ideal situation where everybody can get together and compromise and either be a little happy or a little unhappy or combination of both. Uh, I do like the fact that the site plans, whether individual or collective, will come back to us and there will be limitations based on the floor area ratio, the parking requirements, impervious surface, and things like that, that will control to a degree what gets done and how it gets done. But it would be nice if we had another uh, availability to uh, limit, whether it by warrant or, or other restriction, the floor area ratio being bumped up so much. So we, you know, to scale it realistically, I understand you can't you know, build something on a square and expect it to be viable. But uh, there should be some oversight and that can be self-enforced and self-presented when it comes back before us. So I ask you to keep that in consideration. All right, any further comments before we vote? Can we have a roll call, please? Ms. Early. Yes. Mr. Rockline? Yes. Ms. Francis? No. Mr. Vesey? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. All right. 
Thank uh, you all again. And I promise we'll do, we will keep all of your comments to heart. Thank, Thank you. All. Thank you. Uh, commissioners it, or board members, it's nine o'clock. Uh, item seven is the <laughs> workshop session. Uh, I'm inclined for us to pick it up in two weeks. Uh, I don't. I don't think most of us are at our best at this point to <laughs> to try to delve into that. Is is that agreeable? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So, staff comments, real quick, then. No. Um, you know, I, I just I would like to just you know at any point in time, you know, I, I feel like we're just procedurally we're still working through a lot of things and. You know, please don't hesitate to call myself, call the attorney. Um, you know, uh, you know, just I would rather have conversations, you know, in advance and understand what people's concerns are. You know, also, and I would just ask, understanding, you know, I'm also have to be meeting the board of commissioners' wants and needs and things as well. So, you know, the things, that, the materials that come forward, you know, we're, you know. We're doing our best, but if we're not getting it there for you, we need to know that. And, you know, you know, so we're receptive to whatever we've got to do to make these things, you know, at least, you know, as transparent as possible, you know, given the limitations of what I got to work under. So just wanted to say that. Thank you. And I, I do try, I mean, I, I met with you last week. I do try yeah. to do that. This was a question I didn't even know I could ask. I didn't know that, that, that there was knowledge of what was there. I would have asked if I'd have known you'd known. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it wasn't a question that did even cross my mind to ask. Right, I understand. I just was not under that impression. And I'm still learning, so I'm not trying to bring things up like yeah. on the spot like that. I am trying to avoid those issues. Understood, I appreciate it. <laughs> and under under board comments, I, I would say uh, it's, this is another one of those items to add to our list, I think, when, mm -hmm. when we do in a workshop setting, yeah. talk about problems that we've run into on, on making the the ordinance and and the and the processes and everything dovetail and work for us. I think somehow we we need a way on a, a swap of uh, zoning and land use like this one to s perhaps limit the intensity of floor area ratios or. Or things like that, so that so that we don't wind up giving a developer a uh, uh, hundred percent increase mm -hmm. in the floor area ratio that they can build. But you know, before, and I know that the hearing is closed, so mm -hmm. I don't know if I can ask. But I know that last time, about a representative to kind of give the BOC a summary of. Is it ah. too late now? To like, I was going to ask if Merle. You you still are are in your session, so okay. if you want to make a motion. <laughs> to have him represent? I mean, if he's, just to kind of explain the, <coughs> yeah. the process, I mean, you'd have to go to the meeting. <laughs> I think it would, yeah, I, th I think it would make sense because they might be able to do something to af affect, or to eventually help us affect that mm -hmm. change yeah, too. Yeah, so. most so. accurately reflect the, describe the, all those meetings, and you were here for all of them, so. Mm. Yeah, when, when will this go to them? The date was on there. We can first meeting in August, I think. Next I'll, week. I'll. I think it's next week. Okay. I'll either either make a point of attending, or if for some reason I can't, we'll we'll get somebody else to go. Thanks. Yeah. Um, but do do, do, you do it. Yes, please do it with a motion. It was uh, oh, Georgiana's okay. motion. Yeah, a motion to um, have <laughs> um, Mr. Um, Seaman represent the board's vote in past votes, I guess, on that. What's the resolution? Um, How's it's up? item 22, application 22-141. Um, and if you want to do chair or vice chair, because he said he wasn't sure if he would be available, um, just in case. Okay. Okay. And then I guess, <clears throat> Robert, would you want to do the vice chair? You could go through Zoom. Right? If the, the regular vice chair is not available, that, that's fine. And I, I would second Georgiana's motion. Okay. Roll call. Ms. Early? Yes. Mr. Rockline? Yes. Ms. Francis? Yes. Mr. Vesey? Yes. Mr. Seaman? Yes. All right. 
And if there's no further board comments, that brings us to adjournment. I'll. I'll <coughs> <laughs> I feel like I've kind of been neutered. They took took my gavel away. Now we know how to get them, don't we? <laughs> Take the gavel. Some carry it.